Welcome back to Post Traumatic Thriving. We're in episode two, the dive stage. Yep. I'm here with my wonderful co host, Tanya Brown. <laughs> Hi, Randy. Oh, my God. This is amazing. Yeah. So what exciting. do you think of our guest, Jesse? <laughs> Beautiful. Uh, me? <laughs> you, you got it. You got it. No, this is maybe my episode four. This is absolutely incredible. I love your energy, her energy. This is just going to be an amazing episode. This one, this one is going to be heavy. Brace yourselves, but there's going to be a lot of a lot of hope in this story. Oh yeah, yeah it's going to get real. People. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and welcome back, Jesse. We're so glad you're here. So Thanks for having me. Yeah, back. absolutely. So uh, we're going to talk about that day. What was the day? What was the exact day? The day was May 19th, <gasps> That's Nicole's birthday. It's Nicole's birthday. We have a lot of random similarities with our stories. Whoa. Like do, 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 yeah. do, 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 <laughs> do, Literally. Wow. Just yeah. So Amy Fisher showed up on your doorstep on Nicole Brown Simpson's birthday. Yes. But apparently she showed up on our doorstep a few times before that because she was actively stalking my mother for six months. Really? Wow. Really? Okay. How did Amy Fisher come about? Let's kind of maybe. Well, yeah, just it's it's it's, it's the spotlights on you. Tell tell us the story the way you want to tell it. Excellent. So, um, you know, May 19th, 1992. Amy Fisher came to my front door, uh, knocked on the door, talked to my mother for a few minutes. And as they were wrapping up their conversation, my mom went to turn inside uh, and Amy pulled out a gun from her pocket and aimed it at my mother's head. And it went in on her right ear. The bullet shattered a bunch of stuff and wound up at the base of her spine. Um, But before that happened, uh, Amy Fisher was in a, I don't know if you want to call it relationship with my father. Amy Fisher was a working prostitute, had been for a while, had a madam, had all that kind of stuff, like had a pager in high school. And in the 90, 1992, the only people that had pagers were doctors and hookers. Wow. <laughs> so she had one. <clears throat> wow. Um, and, I didn't even know that. And she, so she was 17 not years old. to legitimize her, but yeah. And so even that fact alone, and we can get into that later because it's not even necessarily about her and her trauma and her story, but A, how a 16 year old becomes a prostitute in a rich, wealthy neighborhood in Long Island, New York is problematic to me. Yeah. Why that was never an issue is also problematic. To yeah. Me. Yeah. I have a feeling because all the New York cops at the time and judges were ah, on the black book roster. There and she you was go. probably servicing a lot of people as well. So that's just my two cents. Yeah, but I can't prove that. So don't sue me. <laughs> um, but, but it makes sense. <laughs> um, and so I think she, I, I know because it's been adjudicated and it's um, in a testimonial like documents, um, for when she was in jail on another incident, uh, she was abused by her father sexually. And so she comes from her own set of trauma Mm -hmm. that I can never understand or realize. So Mm -hmm. by the time she met my father, it was a disaster waiting to happen. My dad, like I said in last episode, larger than life character, fun, big, strong guy, you know, funny. He was everything she wanted, either in a father or in a partner. Okay. And so anyone that's gonna get in her way of that, she was going to take out. And so that's when I think the obsession with my mother started, whether or not they had my, my dad and her had a long relationship or a one-time deal. I don't know. My father had a sex addiction. He's, she's not the only hooker that she (laughs) he's been with. Um, and so much so, I mean, he's been jailed for, well, that's episode 49, uh, soliciting (laughs) a prostitute. Like he, his, his cocaine addiction led to a sex addiction that led to this traumatic day. And so By the time I think, you know, she just got obsessed with my mother. And so she hired or tried to hire multiple people in her circle to take my mom out first. Um, There were incidents of, of she hired people to stalk my mother and myself and my brother, get our schedules, our routines, where we go to school, what time we get picked up, dropped off. She was stalking all of the, including you. Uh Uh-huh. I didn't know it at the time. Oh my God. I didn't didn't know know that that either. either. Yeah. And so, um, and, and we recently, a couple of years ago, did an ABC 2020 special and that brought to light uh, one of the people that she had hired to do the job. He, she paid him in, you know, cash and blow jobs. Um, But basically there was one particular time that rattles me, to be honest, where Amy um, hired other people to do it and they chickened out, right? They just took the cash and ran. When you say do it to murder your mother. Right. Uh, There was one incident where um, I was at school. Uh, My mom was painting in the kitchen. And when she went to the restroom, someone shot a bullet through our front window and it wound up lodged in our living room wall. Oh my God. And the cops came uh, and they were like, oh, it's just neighborhood kids. (laughs) Like it was chalked up 
to nothing. No one investigated. It wasn't uh-huh. a thing at all. And we were like, thank God my mom went to the bathroom. Yeah. You know, we were just like, wow, you know, someone, but it was like a straight up like 22, like gun. This wasn't a BB gun. This wasn't a water balloon. You know, mm-hmm. this was someone a gun pointed a gun at our front window and shot through it. And it wound up lodged in our wall. Okay. Wow. I want to get into all that, but where the question I'm dying to ask you when this all went down, cause we know Amy Fisher showed up at the front door of right. your home and it was in Long Island still. Mm-hmm. Um, somehow I had it in my head and it was in New Jersey, but it sounds like I'm wrong on mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. But your Amy mm-hmm. Fisher showed up on Long Island uh, with a gun, shot your mother. Where were you when this happened? I was at school. I tend oh, to always okay. be at school when things okay. when she is. Okay. <laughs> um, but you know what? She visited our house um, in October, the day after Halloween with um, selling candy. And I put that in air quotes yeah. for uh, Massapequa High School fundraiser. Um, in an attempt to lure my mother out of the house because she had someone waiting on the side in the bush with a gun. Oh my God. Um, but Gosh. my mother didn't go outside. She actually brought Amy Fisher into our house while she went and got her purse, gave her two bucks for the Snickers because she was like, hey lady, will you buy this candy, please? And my mom's like, it's the day after Halloween. I got enough candy right. from the world. <laughs> she this showed up the day after Halloween? Yeah. Yes. My mom's so like, she who wasn't is this? A very That's smart why yeah. I yeah. to my mom because she's like, who is this kid selling candy the day after, after Halloween? <laughs> and then when she left, she turned over the Snickers bar and it said like Ralph's two ninety nine. So it was recently bought from a supermarket, but you know, it, it, it was just a ruse to try to get my mom out of the house to murder right. her. Gotcha. Um, and for angels didn't let that happen that day. And my mom, when she turned it over, she's like, ah, that kid stole from me. And she was going to go outside to confront her. But by the time that happened, she was she gone. Was already so gone. She got in her getaway car. She bounced, she left. She was like, what? That was weird. But again, Okay. Random. So, yeah, so your that was story, October. you were in school, but let me, b- before this all happened, when your mother was shot in the face, and I think everybody knows she survived her injuries, right. mm-hmm. but, um, and you're at school. Had you ever heard anything about Amy Fisher or anything about this, even though she was stalking you, she was stalking right. your no. mother. Um, had you heard anything about anything? Nope. Never saw her, never met her, never heard her name to this day. I've still never met her or seen her in person. She just exists on this like digital media platform, like a Disney villain to me. It's kind of strange, but yeah, no, I was, um, I never met her, never saw her, none of that. So by the time May 19th came, I mean, October to May, October, November, December, January, February, March, April, May. That's seven, seven months. months. So this this girl has been stewing for a long time. So by the time she got to and every she's like, fine, I'll do it myself. And so that was the day, May 19th at 1030 in the afternoon. OK, and like, the, it wasn't even lunch yet. And, wow. and the yeah. other the other question I got for you, Jesse, is mm-hmm. it sounds to me that even though the relationship might have started as your father hiring a high school hooker, which is kind of yeah. unbelievable. Um, it had transitioned from a kind of a business transaction to uh, an emotional attraction, mm-hmm. at least from her perspective. Is Am I accurate in That's that? That's what I seem to think. Because yeah. honestly, I think just with her own, you know, abuse and trauma, like her, everything was set up to latch on to something that she wanted mm-hmm. and that she was going to, take out anybody in her way. Yeah. That's kind of the vibes. I was the daddy figure, the father figure, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then prostitution, right? All the save me, take me out. And then when she saw how lovely our life was, she goes, I want that. I want that. I want to be that. She wanted to replace your mother with herself. I think so. As a 17 year old girl. Yeah. I believe delusional. Yeah. Okay. And did your, did your dad on that day that that happened? Did she, did he share in the sentiment that I want to be with this person uh, you know, romantically. Or Absolutely not. It, it, First of all, my father's a sociopath and a narcissist with okay. a sex addiction. <laughs> so he does whatever the fuck he wants, when he wants to do it with whoever, who he wants to do it. Okay. Um, He's a doozy. You know, I don't, it, I, for him, he was not look, he had it all. He had a, a beautiful wife, amazing children, a nice house, a boat, like, He's not stupid, like as stupid as he is, he's not that stupid. Okay. <laughs> you know, I don't think he did this with the So this is a one way, this is a one life. way deal. Yeah. Got it. And so, you know, um, for, I mean, I've heard the story told now from my mother. I've heard it told from my father. I've heard it told from my uncles and my aunts. Cause my dad is one of five and my mom is one of five. So okay. when this tragedy happened, Aunt Ann came to come meet, pick me and my brother up from school. Aunt Eileen went here. My uncle Bobby went here. You know, everybody, everybody was and involved this was before cell phones. So this was an old school, like the way it all, my, my grandmother who worked at the church on like the corner 
um, remembers hearing all these sirens and all these fire trucks going towards her mm. daughter's house, but not thinking it was for her daughter. Yeah. And right. so she got a phone call 15 minutes later oh and says, Mary Jo's been shot. She goes, what, what's she doing in Brooklyn? Like it doesn't, it, it, it didn't compute for our family. And so they also didn't know this was a 16 year old girl that did this at the time. So oh, she was 16. Happened, I thought she was 17. Yeah, I mean, 16, 17, 16, 17. Right? Okay. Yeah, six, I am 16 going on 17. <laughs> okay, okay. You know, she's not dancing in a gazebo with Ralph. She, you know, <laughs> a little bit more than that. But um, so, you know, it was chaos because they just thought this murderer was on the street. No one understood why, you know, Mary Jo, she's the nicest person. in the Well, yeah. And so um, home base wound up being my dad's auto body shop. So my aunt came to pick me up from school um, and it was early and it was a big day for me because I had ridden my bike for the very first time to school. And that was like a rite of oh, passage wow. at the time. Uh -huh. And it was like, you know, um, I, my mom was teaching me how to use a bike lock earlier and like, you have to be responsible, you know, like this was a big day for me to prove my responsibility. Mm -hmm. And it was also the same day that we were having auditions for the school play. And like, I'm a musical theater. Like I was about to like, this was my day, you know? And then before lunch, it all came piling down and I had to leave early before the auditions and my aunt came and I was like, what's going on? Wait, I need my bike. I can't leave school without my bike. Mom's going to kill me. And my aunt's like, fuck the bike. <laughs> right? <laughs> and so, but like, I was being so like, mom's going to kill me if I don't take care of this bike, not realizing my mom's dying in a hospital. Yeah. Now. But like, she's like, fine. And we got the bike. We threw it in the You're back of a the Continental and we went to my dad's <laughs> shop. And when I got there, um, the decision was made for all the grownups not to tell me what happened. Everybody else knew but me, including my brother, uh, who's three years older than me. And so he was in sixth grade at the time. I was in third grade. Mm -hmm. But um, usually when my family gets together, it's Christmas, it's Easter, it's birthday, it's a barbecue, it's happy, it's it's fun, it's a lot. You know, it's it's Italian food. It's, it's all, it's, you know, intense. And I was nine, bless you, baby. But bless you, honey. Um, you know, when I got to my dad's shop and the whole family was there and everyone's in like this main lobby kind of room looking like I've never seen before, mm -hmm. uh, vacant, confused, shell shocked, scared. Um, all I know is my mom wasn't there. My dad wasn't there. Um, and, you know, before I get to this part, I think it's important to say, too, you know, I've talked to my uncle who has described the scene because my dad's work was only 15 minutes away from our house. And so when my mom was shot, there were two people working at the beach next door who happened to be retired uh, police and firefighters. And so by the grace of God, they heard the shot and oh, they wow. came running over Ooh. and they saw my mom lying down. They thought she was laying out on a red blanket, like sun tanning, oh, wow. uh, but it was her a blood. pool of her own blood. And they knew how to stop the bleeding. They knew what to do. Like they weren't just some guys off the street. These were, you know, fire, New York, NYPD, NYFD yeah. trained, retired, you know, people that came oh, and, and helped God they her. Were there. And then the neighbor across the street heard it and came out and thought she was laying on a red blanket, saw what's going on. So he wound up calling 911. They wound up calling my dad's shop and say, Joe, you got to get home. Something's not good. Get home now. Uh, and my grandfather was like, you need to go take your brother. Let's go. And sent his two boys to my house. And when they pulled up, my uncle describes it. He goes, I thought it was a parade because there were so many cops and so many fire trucks that, you know, that's, that's when you see it. When yeah, you see just, a parade. yeah. And, and, and apparently when my uncle and my dad got to the scene, they were just about to load my mom into the helicopter to take her life flight, her out of there, which they landed on the beach next door. Um, and I guess they were kept my dad and my brother. They tell my dad and my uncle, they tell the story. They were running to the helicopter, running, running. And like six New York police officers tackled my dad because he's the husband. You right. know what's going the on. Suspect. And he's trying to go see his wife, but he had some like superhuman Hulk strength. And so he's just <laughs> rah, running down and like, even the P the New York police department joke, they're like, we got sand in our boots because he was just dragging us. It was like, he, would, they, he was just so much strength in times of stress like that. Yeah. I don't think he wound up making it to the helicopter, but because all the cops went on my, my dad, my uncle wound up being able to get to the helicopter and see my mom right before she was being airlifted. And I'll never forget his face when he told me this. He's like, I, her face was blown off. Like it was, 
her, it, I mean, to see that scene, oh. it's gotta be, you know, so intense. And so by the time I get to them, you know, they've been having this, dealing with this for a couple hours now. I got to my dad's work and everybody was just, I mean, confused, blanks face, like what's, what, what's going on? Who did this? Uh -huh. You know, what's going on? No one knew. And they had told me that my mother, I don't think, no, they didn't tell me actually what happened to her quite yet. All I know is I was sitting on my aunt's lap at like the receptionist desk. The receptionist says where? At my dad's work. Oh, it was okay. a family business. So, so, so it's my, everyone in the family. So, so everybody's so just so, still there. Yeah. yeah. So just so I have your chronology, mm -hmm. you're at school, your aunt shows up, mm -hmm. get in the car, get the bike in the car, right. and they drive to your dad's It work. was a family auto body business. So my and, grandpa owned it. My dad worked there. My uncle worked there. My aunt worked there. It was like everybody okay, worked so in an auto body. I knew your dad worked there, but I didn't realize it was a family business. Yes, okay. it was. Okay, so you're there with a lot of family surrounded. Both sides. And what now. were you being told? What were, At that time, what were you being told? So I wasn't necessarily told anything besides mom's hurt. We need to go. And okay. I'm... I can, I'm very intuitive. I pick up on a lot of stuff and I sure. can tell what they were telling me was not everything, but I yeah. can also tell that this was not the time to say, why, why, yeah. why? They My, were yeah. protecting you. Yeah, and, and I, I, yes, yeah, and they're in they shock were. too. Yeah. yeah. You tell a nine-year-old, okay. you know? And so like the first thing that happened, I remember I was sitting on my aunt's lap and everyone looks nuts. And I just am picking this up. <laughs> and <laughs> I see a camera. I have to smile at it. Um, <laughs> And so, <laughs> and so I'm picking uh, up the vibe and I forever, my role is to alleviate stress. If I, if this, something's uncomfortable, I crack a joke. That's just kind of my nature. It always has. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so I say in front of everyone in a silent moment, I said, uh, what's the matter with everybody? It looks like someone got shot in the head or something. Oh no. I said those exact words wow. and everyone wow. went, whoosh Whoa. to me and of like and my aunt yelled at me she said who told you that and i was like and oh. i got the vibe i said something wrong and i was you know oh, nobody i literally I was just making a joke y'all seem like something's up you know and i was just trying <laughs> wow. to find it. and it turns out um wow. they wound up telling me that she was painting in the backyard she wound up falling off the bench that she was standing on and her head fell on a nail that was sticking up on the ground. Oh and I was like, gosh. that's fine. I stepped on a nail last summer. Like, can I go see her? Like, that's, a, that's not that bad. <laughs> um, but they wouldn't let me visit her. And they told me it was because they don't let children into the hospital. And so I could just tell people were lying to me. Yeah. And to this day, I have a real big problem with people lying to me. Mm. And it's because directly related to this. Cause then once they did tell me the truth, I'm, was like, so how long were you going to lie to me? What if she died? Is yeah. this what you were going to go to the grave? Like, guys, right. yeah. I'm a part of this family too. I can handle it. Yeah. And like, it was this battle of like, I'm the youngest, I'm the baby, they're protecting me. But at the same time, like I can handle this shit that's going on, what's going on. Yeah. Okay, so let me, let me recap, because this is really fascinating. Mm -hmm. You're nine years old. Your mom's been shot in the head by Amy Fisher. Mm -hmm. You're taken by your aunt on your dad's side. Is that right? Yeah, okay. my godmother. Okay. So your aunt on your dad's side takes you to the family business where your dad works and your other relatives on your dad's side. And my work. mom's side. Oh, and your mom's Everybody side. Everybody wound up there. Oh, is that right? You weren't, they weren't at the hospital. They were at the auto body shop. Okay. Yeah. They were very close families. They lived in the same neighborhood. Like my aunts and my okay. uncles were, you know, knew each other since 15. Okay. You know, yeah, so yeah. they were in the neighborhood. Everybody knew the butter gotcha. kids at the church, Connery girls. So it was like a thing. Okay. So both your mom and dad's side mm -hmm. were in the family business auto body shop, mm -hmm. you're there and they start BSing you mm -hmm. and telling you this concocted story that your mom fell off a ladder and hit a board with a nail in it. Right. And you're sitting there picking up the vibes, even as a nine-year-old. This is pretty serious for a nail. Yeah. 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 And, and, and you're, yeah. <laughs> they just kind of, uh, I don't know what's the right word, but kind of diminishing your capabilities of figuring things out, yeah. thinking that they can su successfully BS you and yeah. telling you stories they're in shock. I, I get the reasons. I don't agree with the reasons, but I get the reasons. Yeah. And in the meantime, you're the little girl sitting there scared because you love your mom. You're hurt. Mm -hmm. You know she's hurt. Right. Your families must be acting goofy on both sides of the family. Mm -hmm. And you're trying to make sense of it all. You're cracking jokes. Your aunt gets mad at you. Mm -hmm. 
but they're BSing you and you sense that as a kid. Do I have that right? 100%. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Because, you know, I, I, the story's about you, but I got to interject. When I, I was not told till I was nine years old that I had to have open heart surgery. Hmm. I saw a cardiologist every, every year, but I was always just like, I just thought it was normal. <laughs> and yeah. It wasn't normal. Yeah. And one day my mom slipped. She was mm -hmm. sitting on the couch and, you know, our fam, our home overlooked Disneyland. You know, you were by the beach, mm -hmm. we were by Disneyland. And, uh, my mom said, um, you know, Randy, there's a story in the LA Times about a, a guy who had the same heart surgery you're going to have to have. <gasps> and, and he's bullying today. And I thought, as a nine-year-old kid, I thought, what's so miraculous about a guy bullying? What's wrong with me? <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, and I was BSed. Not so much like I was told a concocted story, but it was omitted. Right. I wasn't being told the truth. Right. And that's, in the, I get why, because yeah. they're trying to protect us. Yeah. I don't think yeah. they handle us, but yeah. I think kids know. Yeah. Little kindergartens. They, yeah. they know. Yeah. They know. Yeah. yeah. So, so I want to pause, right? I want to hear the whole story. This is going to be most thorough examination of your story ever, <laughs> ever. ever happened. I'm into it. Because okay. y'all are asking questions too that other people and other productions I've been a part of don't ask. And I think it's because of your mental health background. Yeah. And also just, you know, I don't know. Y'all are doing good. Keep okay. Going. Okay. Good. Well, we're good. Keep the Glad party you saw two yeah. <laughs> no, no, I guarantee you, you will feel thoroughly stripped, <laughs> search, searched, and deposed by the end of this. Oh, that was a funny thing. How, that's episode five. How I learned what a strip search was. It's G. Yeah, it's G rated. It's G rated. Yeah, G rated. We won't strip search you, but we will oh, depose that was you. A good story. No, I'm just teasing. But oh, but there. okay. Here's this is here's what I want to pause. Is that in your trauma, my trauma, I mean, you, Tanya, you were told the truth about your yes, trauma. Yes, I was older. But, I was but 24. But we were both be kind of BS'd. Yeah. My mom's 99, believe it or not. I, still in my childhood home. I love her. I've forgiven her. But let's talk about what should have happened. What should your aunt, and I'm not saying your aunt did anything wrong because they probably your aunt probably didn't get the right they conversation know. they're and they're you also know. old school Italian Catholics. I didn't know doesn't know how to handle trauma either or yeah, yeah, yeah. talk about things. Yeah. Like, bury like, it. If something happens, you just don't talk about yeah. it. Got you know? it. Yeah. So it was like, got it. Yeah. You bury but we've it. We've evolved. Right. We've evolved and we know better right. today. Right. So let's share with each other and the audience what should have happened when you're dealing with a kid with trauma mm -hmm. uh, in a traumatic situation. What is the right way to handle it? So that you don't walk away like you did saying, hey, my own aunt BS me and my mom, my own mom and dad, you know, omitted <laughs> kind of important facts. I should have been told what should those conversations right. look like? Because guess what? That rocked my ability to trust people mm -hmm. from that point on. There you go. So if they had at least been even vaguely honest rather yeah. than feeding me like blatant bullshit, it yeah. probably would have been more helpful for my ability to trust others. Right. Plain this, and simple. This is really interesting. And I don't think, I don't think I've ever even shared this before. When, um, when the kids were brought down, it, I think, okay, so Nicole, we found out on a Monday that Nicole was killed. She got killed on Sunday. Monday or Tuesday, the kids were brought down from LA. And my mom sat the kids down on our piano bench and knelt down and told them so eloquently mm -hmm. and so beautifully Mommy's not coming back. She's in heaven. And it was like, but then after that, we, we, we didn't tell them what was going on. We didn't tell her. We didn't communicate with the kids. The TVs were off. So as you're saying this, I'm like, wow, that could, that could, you know, be the reason why some of the things that they've experienced in their life is because we didn't expose them. We didn't communicate with, you know, what was going on because, you know, why expose such trauma to a child? So this kind of like hits home with me. Wow. And you know what? I got to be honest. I've always related to Sydney and Justin because we are these we, random. In young the same nine, age. Exactly. Same, same age. age. All of that. And just um, it's remarkable to hear how your mother was so gentle with. Oh, us. my God. So gentle. But it, you know what? There's something to that because I was exposed to all of it. I watched the news. I watched Saturday Night Live when Danny DeVito's playing my dad. I watched all that stuff. Yeah. So maybe that's what fucked me up a little bit more than the other <laughs> there too. But it's so interesting to hear that part of your story. Yeah. Because um, I've always wondered. You know, I wonder how they handled it. I and wonder I, what's going on in that there. And my mom, my mom had said, and God bless her soul, but she said, maybe if we would have gotten the kids, they never sought therapy. 
They did one time with a therapist here in Dana Point. He was absolutely awful. And after that, it was like, okay, I think he's messing the kids up more. I had yeah. the same experience. Same thing. I and sat there like this. Yeah. Go play recess. They were, I don't want to talk to you right now. They were yeah. more interested in like the case and everything mm-hmm. instead of like their mental well-being, right? Mm-hmm. And exactly. then after that, exactly. And after that, it was like, you know, we didn't put him back into therapy. And then we didn't have, you know, again, like I told you with the TVs were off, we didn't talk about it. We would go to court, we'd come home, we'd go to the beach, create some sort of normalcy. Normalcy. Right. So, you know, maybe perhaps had we, you know, like what my mom said, maybe if we would have told them Mm -hmm. things would have turned out a little bit different. I mean, and they're doing great. I mean, Sydney had a baby, Justin's having a baby, you know, they're in great relationships. Yeah. But there were things along the way, you know, between then and, you know, 36, 37 years old that now as we're having this conversation mm-hmm. makes sense. Well, let, let's pause on your parents, what they did, mm-hmm. because there's an example of the right way to do it. Cause I, I had the privilege of knowing both your parents. I can't even put into words how much love and respect I have for both of them. And they, no surprise, exemplified exactly the right thing to do. Don't lie. You know, don't BS. Yeah. Don't omit, omit uh, you know, r- the harsh reality. You know, I could have handled it as a kid. You probably could have handled it. Mom's been hurt in the head. We don't know what's going on. She's in the hospital. We'll let you know. Mm-hmm. That that would right. be all truthful. Right. Yeah. And you would not have wound up with a, I don't know a better word, a kind of a complex mm-hmm. over this, you know, people being honest to you. Mm-hmm. You know, your parents, no surprise, did exactly the right thing. They told the truth at an age appropriate, you know, in an age Level. appropriate way. But telling, telling the truth in that mommy's not coming back, but we didn't expose them to how mommy died, what happened to mom. Like, well, yeah, yeah we didn't I mean, share telling the that. truth doesn't mean you tell the details, the, right. but yeah. particularly at a time where it's utter chaos and confusion. Right. Yeah. But if your mom were to set them down, she oh, she's in Hawaii. She'll be back yeah, next Disneyland. week. Disneyland. Like, yeah. Like, <laughs> well, she was in Hawaii. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's your dad, Hawaii. Joey's at Disneyland when he's really, right. you know, in <laughs> co- <laughs> cocaine <laughs> rehab. Right. <laughs> Right. There's kind of a theme here. Yeah. Your family's, you know, this wonderful Italian Catholic fun family. But when it comes to these uncomfortable topics, there's some BS going on. We're going to avoid it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Dad's at Disneyland. And I grew up with those notes for a long time. Okay. That's how I learned how to shut down emotionally and just be fine. Yeah. Yeah. And And we all know what fine stands for. Oh, what? (laughs) Effed up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. There you go. That's it. That's it. It's true. Here I've been studying trauma for 15 years and I just learned this. Effed up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. It's true. It's all of those. And when you say to the world that I'm fine, really, that's what you're saying to the world. (laughs) Effed up, insecure, neurotic, and emotional. Okay. There's something to memorize. There's a a fun little acronym for folks. (laughs) We all need to learn. (laughs) (laughs) Got them good. Wow. Okay. So... That's Focusing funny. on you that day, <laughs> you're you're in the parents' body shop or your family's mm-hmm. body shop. You're being BS. You're sensing it. The family's actually getting mad at you for inappropriate jokes where that doesn't make sense mm-hmm. because you're just a little kid. Right. Give me a break. What happens next to you? So then afterwards, I couldn't go home for two weeks because it was an active crime scene and paparazzi started showing up. And so I got, and what were you being told at that time when you did, where did you go? I went to my uncle's house. Okay. Um, where with my little cousins and wound up sleeping there. It felt like an eternity. Could have been a day or two. Yeah. I don't know. (laughs) Yeah. Um, and what were you being told? All I know is I wasn't allowed to go back to school. Um, I wasn't really being told much. I was just, you know, did you see the paparazzi or exposed to any of that? Yeah. Not yet. Cause I was only at my uncle's house, which was a safe haven. But yeah. while my younger cousins went off to school, I was like, why can't I go to school? Mm-hmm. Um, I wasn't allowed at school. And I was like, but you know, the play is about to start and I'm going to be cast as James and James and the giant peach. Let's go. <laughs> um, but I wasn't allowed back at school. I wasn't allowed back at home. And I remember, I guess my dad had packed my overnight clothes and like a bag of clothes. And um, this is when I really started to like miss my mom because uh, when I had to change into my pajamas that first night, it was my absolute least favorite pair of pajamas, <laughs> like three sizes too small, button up the front. So when you have to pee in the middle of the night, it's cold. 
And I just remember being like, mom would have packed me the pajamas I like. Oh. You know, dad packed my bag. And it was just like, and it started to be like, mom would have done it like this. But yeah, where's mommy? Yeah, because like, I wasn't allowed to see her. And, you know, talking about her, it was, it was just, it, it was so chaotic. And so I think it was just play Nintendo. Shh, don't yeah. ask questions. Stay busy. Go play with your cousins, you know, stay busy. So did your cousins, uh, they were the they same were age as They were younger than me. So and they didn't know like, what was, like six and they didn't know what was going on. No. No, so, no. so all the kids, all you kids were, were kept in, ignorance. kept in the dark. My brother was, um, told and aware of things. Was he there? He in was the same expected home? to keep it quiet from me and lie to me too, which oh, was really hard oh, no. for him, I think. Yeah. He yeah. would visit her. He'd go to the hospital. And actually there's a lovely story. My mom was in a coma. My brother, I guess, went and held her hand and my mom squeezed it and cried um, oh. in a coma. And so like, knowing like that's she power. to this day says you know when she got shot she was thinking about my brother and I and like I need to get up the kids are coming home from school I need to get up the kids are coming home from uh -huh. school so she's like a mom through and through yeah. um but I remember being jealous I'm like how come Paul gets to go visit her how come I can't go visit her I thought you said children aren't allowed in the hospital I keep catching everyone in their lies uh -huh. and then they just they you know they didn't have they shut it down right mm -hmm. and so um I think it was just you know probably days of me being relentless of like someone's going to tell me what's going on around here. So right. that must have been very frustrating. It yeah. was extremely So frustrating. there's layered trauma going on here. Number one, your mom's hurt. You know that. Right. She's in the hospital. You right. know that. Right. But you're sensing uh, BS bombs going off All left day. and right. Yes. And even your own brother, who's three years older, he's getting the privilege of some truth right. and reality. You're not. Mm -hmm. And you know something's up. Mm-hmm. What, 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 as a young little girl who loves her mom, who misses her mom, uh, what is, what's going through your mind as you're laying down in bed to go to sleep? I mean, I think just fear and, you know, worry. Um, and I don't know at the same, it's so long ago at this point too, you yeah. know, I'm 39, sure. okay. uh, you know, but yeah. I just remember being missing her. Yeah. And I didn't see my dad that day either. And I didn't, now the next day, and now I haven't seen my parents, but either one of them in two days, three days, I'm just with my uncle and my aunt who are great and lovely, but like, where are my parents? Yeah. What's going on? And did your dad, dad show up to visit you? No. And that's what's fucked up, messed up. Um, well, I think we've crossed the line. Again. Exactly. It's all <laughs> good. My dad packed my bag and dropped it off. And I remember being like, why didn't he come inside to see me? So your dad's dropping mm. stuff off with the wrong pajamas. He's not even coming to coming see in, how his right. daughter's doing. And you oh, know, wow. what's interesting is, and my aunt brought, my aunt Ursula brought this up to me actually like last year when we were talking about it. Um, Cause he never told me what was going on either. I was given the news via a newspaper. Oh, wow. And a nine-year-old with ADD and reading comprehension. I get handed a newspaper from my aunt because I was just being relentless. And what do I tell her? What do we tell Jesse? What do we tell Jesse? My dad wasn't taking on that responsibility. And neither Your dad's not even visiting you. Right. And so- um, So there's abandonment the too. I mean, he's busy. It's not like he's kicking it on a beach, tanning with Hawaiian tropic. Right. But um, he wasn't necessarily being a father in that moment yeah. either. Right. Um, and so my aunt had handed me a newspaper- that had a picture of our front house on it with crime scene tape and a cop car in front of it had a picture of my mom next to it. And the headline just said like local woman shot or something. And, and, and your I aunt just hands this to you. Right. She's like, remember how we told you mom hit a nail? Well, it didn't really happen that way. Oh, and, and hand just hands, hands you a paper. Oh my, my God. God. Now I have a diagnosed reading comprehension problem <laughs> to this day. If I read something, I'm in my thoughts somewhere else. I'm not understanding what I'm reading. Okay. All I saw was my mom's picture. All I saw was the picture of my house that I was just playing on that tree on three days ago. And I haven't been able to get back to. And pretending to read it because like I'm like this is my job and this is what she told me to do but like I don't understand what this shit is and I just went like this and I put the paper down she looked at me and she was like do you understand honey and I was just like no mm -hmm. and she finally was like you know it wasn't a nail um your mom was shot and um you know she's gonna be okay but you know she's really hurt and all that stuff and so mm -hmm. I think once I was kind of told the information, I was relieved because I was like, I fucking knew it. <laughs> like, it wasn't a nail. I knew it. You know? It's more of like, aha, I've, I've, well, great. All right, let's go see her. Come yeah. On. You know, like I wasn't scared. I wasn't upset. Like also gun violence wasn't a thing in 92. Like 
I didn't know anyone that like there was one guy in the neighborhood that was a Vietnam vet with one leg from his injuries, but like no one else school shootings weren't a thing. Massive right. Shooting, like nothing that didn't exist. Right. Yeah. And so it was all right. Great. Great. Let's go visit her then. And so finally I was allowed to go to the hospital and visit her. Um, and I personally do not have a memory of that. Um, I've been told the memory of it from my aunts who were in the room as they let me in. I do remember them prepping me of like, mom's really hurt. Now is not the time to bring your tap shoes. <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like girl, <laughs> now is not the time. Brace yourself. Right. Like it's, this is not a joke. This is not Jesse be funny. This is not make people laugh. This is serious. Like, and just touching her might be a problem. Mm-hmm. And so I just remember when they, you know, opened that door and I was holding my grandmother's hand and it was just creaking open, you know, and I'm, I'm you're at the hospital. Yeah. And I'm terrified at this point. Yeah. You know, of Not just like what to expect. Right. You know, you just, you don't know. Yeah. And so when I went in there and I see her in a hospital bed and I had brought a stuffed animal to leave with her to try to make her feel better. Hmm. Um, and I just look and I'm like, who is that alien in the hospital bed? Cause that is not my mother. Mm-hmm. Um, her whole head was wrapped um, just with gauze and, and her head was shaved off and, and mm. uh, she was blown up, swollen. Yeah. It looked like a Macy's day parade float. And her voice sounded like Kermit the frog because the bullet nicked something. She had a trach tube in at one point, like she was awake at this point. Oh, she was conscious. She was conscious at this point. Cause she had woken up in side story when she woke up is when they found out Amy Fisher did it because my mom, though she couldn't talk, she had um, trach tubes in. She went like this, made the signal to like a hand signal, like give me a pen and paper. And on that yellow piece of lined paper. Oh my gosh. Did she know the name Amy Fisher? Uh, Not Amy Fisher, but Amy had given my mother a fake name of Anne Marie. And so my mother wrote Anne Marie, 16 years old, you know, um, t-shirt, I think, because Amy Fisher had brought a t-shirt from the body shop over and saying, your sis- your husband's sleeping with my little sister. And my mom goes, your little sister, how old are you? you oh know? my God. <laughs> right. You know, and so my mom just kept being combative. I mean, I'm 38 now. If I opened my door to a 16 year old who I teach 16 year olds all the time, musical theater, I would not be intimidated or scared. Or nothing, sure. you know? Right. So, and so my mom wrote this down because they were looking for a, a maniac dude on the loose, a guy, you yeah. know, they had no, the, no. So the, the cops are just totally in the dark, confused in the dark. And they were idiots back then. And I'll say that now, like I respect <laughs> law enforcement, but the New York police department, Nassau County police department in particular in 1992, fucked this case up so hard. Mm. That's why she only went to jail for eight years and, and uh, wound up getting, uh, taking a plea for uh, aggravated assault. So wow. Wow. that's a whole other story. Okay. Not even so attempted I'm in the murder. hospital room. I see my mother looking like a Macy's Day float. She sounds like Kermit the Frog. And I remember just being on my best behavior, um, quiet, leaving her a stuffed pig animal that I had won at the fair not too long ago. Um, but I don't necessarily remember any more than that. Apparently, my aunt has told me that once I, I kept it together in the room, like, okay, mom, I love you. I'll be back to visit you. Like, I'm fine mm-hmm. <laughs> at nine. Um, and as soon as I walked out the door, apparently I like collapsed and was like shaking and crying in my grandmother's arms. Mm. Very Aww. physically affected. I have no memory of that at all. Um, you don't have memory yeah. of, correct me if I'm wrong. Did I hear you right? That you didn't have a memory of any of this visit. Or a, um, or a little bit? Or? I have like photographs. Like I remember seeing her blown up and I remember that, that part of just the visual, like I kind of have a photographic okay. memory. So okay. I have that, but the emotional breakdown part, okay. I don't have. You don't memory. remember. Okay. So let me ask you, is this in this whole drama, this whole trauma is probably a better word. Is, was this the moment of absolute shock for you where the, where the reality that where you've really kind of confronted where, where, I'm trying to identify kind of a point of tra- of shock. So. Where did the shock happen? Well, we'll get to that. 35 years old when oh, I lost my mind. Okay. All right. <laughs> we'll get so to that. It bites you in the butt right. and that's later. <laughs> All right. There was no time for that because it kept get, like my trauma started there, but it kept getting worse and okay. worse and worse and worse and worse every day, every year, every week week. You know. So when did, if you could, as a child, when this whole event went down, if you could identify uh, like a moment, or maybe there isn't a moment, there's numerous moments, but you tell me, when did you kind of identify that something was very wrong and you were, sh- it kind of went into that 
shock? Because I want to talk about shock for a minute. Mm. Well, I, I knew something was very wrong when I was sitting in my dad's office with my entire family before okay. they told me it was okay. wrong. And you said something really interesting because walking into your mom's uh, hospital room and seeing her, as you described it, that's an alien, not my mom. Mm-hmm. That must have been, so, in fact, it obviously was so shocking your memory even today yeah Yeah. as a 38 year old woman Mm -hmm. is still unclear it and you know what i find so interesting that she was trying so hard to make it seem like she was fine Mm -hmm. how are you you know she's pilled up she has a bullet to the brain she had 50 50 chances of even surviving Uh um and if that what is she going to be like when she comes out of it you know dead blind you know brain dead you know right 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 um and i just remember her trying to alleviate my stress okay Okay. that's a mom okay there's a reason why i'm kind of drilling down to that point. And I, I want to just talk about it for sure. a minute. And, and I, I actually, knowing you were going to be our guest today, I brought this from my house, but this is the human brain cool. uh, or a model. Of right. It. Okay. <laughs> and, and I want to explain, and, and then we do this in the training in the prisons. So, because we under, we, we kind of take a time out to explain the physiology of what's going on. I love that. Okay. One. Okay. Okay. Into it okay. Cause it's so, so cause this is trauma right science. here. Yeah. There's trauma and it's yeah. out there. And yeah. it, it is a science. Right. Yeah. So here's my little, here's my very simplified, probably oversimplified lesson is people think we have a brain. Well, of course we do, but there's, we actually have three brains. Have you, have you heard this before? The three brains? No. Yeah. Okay. Limbic. Well, you're getting <laughs> Those more. Are the Those are the systems. <laughs> more. <laughs> like I just learned about this in class. I forgot oh, yeah. everything the second I got my diploma. The limbic brain, which is uh, our Neanderthal yeah, brain. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, we're going to make it even simple. Okay. We're going to really make this simple for everyone because I'm, I, my IQ is uh, not that high. So we have three brains. The, the outer brain is the human brain. That's where we have logic and conversation and we have empathy for humans on the other side of the planet we've never met. Mm-hmm. That's the distinctly human brain. It's different than the animal brain, mm-hmm. okay? Because Bambi is not walking through the forest thinking about prayer and being charitable to people on the other, uh, you know, right. other deer on the other side of the forest, right. okay? That's the human brain. We're distinctly human. So that's the outer brain. The middle brain... <laughs> is called the mammal brain. That's emotion. Okay. So that you can, you know, dogs can snuggle up, you know, mammals have emotions, Mm -hmm. but the third brain, the inner brain is the reptilian brain. Mm, Okay. My Neanderthal brain. Okay. Okay. (laughs) You want this now. Yeah. Yeah. You know, you're right. Cause it's an instinct. (laughs) It's an instinctual, it's just reaction. Right. Okay. So what happened in your trauma is you're operating with your human brain. You're at school. You're just, you know, doing what school kids do and learning stuff. And you rode your bike to school for the very first time. It's a big day to demonstrate to your family that you're responsible. That's all the kind of logic going on in the human brain. And the, the, the of course, there's emotions with that too. But, and if there's all three brains are working at the same time, but what happens when the shock happens, when you get your aunt shows up at the school mm. to say, you know, Hey, <laughs> Um, something's real wrong, screw the bike, get mm-hmm. in the car, you know, that your, mm-hmm. your memories from the human brain basically turn off mm-hmm. or are diminished greatly. And it goes to the reptilian brain and that's the fight, flight, freeze right. response. Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's why even as today, these memories you said a few times, cause I'm listening very intently to what you're saying for these kind of clues. Um, the the reason why the memory is distorted is completely normal, mm. completely normal, because you start thinking with the reptilian brain. And that's just how do I survive? How does my mom survive? Mm-hmm. You're just going to that part of the brain that says, I just want to get through this, mm-hmm. however the hell I have to do it to stay alive or to keep my mom alive. I'm detecting BS bombs from my family left and right. You're kind of like going through a mental landmine of these bombs going off mm-hmm. of lies and deception and craziness. And you're just trying to survive. Mm-hmm. You're a nine-year-old kid. Try, those instincts are kicking in. Mm-hmm. Does that sound familiar and right? For sure. Oh yeah. Um, 100%. And I was stuck there for 30 years. I was stuck in fight or flight until yeah. I literally had a mental, physical, emotional breakdown yeah. and learned how to not yeah. be, operate in that mode. Yeah. But it started from that time. And then I was continued to stay there 
as, you know, more chaos kept happening because, you know, daddy went to jail. There was trials. There was, you know, pop, there was there's a whole bunch of other stories, too. Right. Um, there was a snowball that started with this one day. Absolutely. Right. Mm-hmm. But I was, I think, stuck in that reptilian, you know, mindset for right. a very long time. Right. Very long. Did time. you experience some sort of am- amnesia also? Because, you know, with the trauma that, you know, after Nicole, there are so many chapters during that during that time mm-hmm. that I do not remember Interesting. at all. Like people will go, yeah, don't you remember saying that? Or do you remember doing that? Or do you remember that was say? I'm like, I have no recollection of it. Good question. But it is, but it is, there is something called, I don't know if it's like called retrograde amnesia, but it, there is a type of amnesia where you do learn, it, where you do lose certain chapters mm. of your life experience from that trauma. I wonder because you were kind of, you were 25 when it all happened. 24, right? yeah. So I'm wondering if there's a difference between that 24 year old brain experiencing trauma versus a nine kid. year one, yeah. because I don't necessarily, I don't necessarily have mem- like there are certain blocks that just aren't there. But at the same time, there's some things that are just recalled. Yeah. And so I don't know, like, I, that's a good, I wonder, like, I wonder if I was from a young age stuck in that mindset versus if I was older, older. and that, you know, was in a fight yeah. or flight. I'm not quite sure. It's interesting. Yeah. Mm. So I'm gonna, mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm gonna ponder. Well, and that's, that's why it's so important because in the San Quentin prison where I'm certified as a group uh, volunteer uh, person, um, we talk about the physiology because, you know, taking a time out and describing and explaining the physiology helps people process their trauma. For sure. Because here's the number one thing. What, and I'm sure you, you, I can tell you've already figured this out, but a lot of people are still working through traumas. Yeah. It's completely normal. Oh, yeah. What people are going through in terms of the hazy memory or the block mm-hmm. memory and the confusion, the fog. It, it starts mm-hmm. with shock. Okay. So, um, you know, the five stages of grief don't include shock. I do because mm-hmm. it's so important. We just talk about what's going on physiologically mm. um, because it, it kind of gives a, a, it starts the healing process to realize, Hey, I'm not a freak. I'm not abnormal as a little girl who's going through this, this insane yeah. circus, media circus and family circus and everything else. And, you know, and with my trauma, which did not make the newspapers, it didn't make you know, anything. Um, I'm going through the same thing. When my mom says to me on the couch, you know, Hey, you're the surgery. And the first time I ever heard it, I had to have an open heart surgery, yeah. you know, and the shock of realizing I don't get to spend the week, you know, the, the summer at the beach. Mm-hmm. I mean, for a nine-year-old kid, that was That's shocking. huge. It's yeah. <laughs> That's huge. Yeah. 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 That's the difference. It's like, no, you can't have, it's not, you can't have ice cream after dinner. This yeah. is your trajectory of your life is changed. And when it's thrown on you like that yeah. yeah, in such a shocking way, yeah, I know for me, physiologically um, sent me to an automatic anxiety attack, but I didn't know it until right. then. I didn't, right. I didn't understand anxiety until I like after realized peace. I just, I operated from nine years old on at a level 100 fear and anxiety level. Mm. Adrenaline. Because also keep in mind now, now that I understand that my mom's been, you know, shot. Now this girl came. What this girl could be my babysitter. What do you mean she's the one that shot? People aren't what they seem. I started to really spin out on my thoughts and um, fear of like, like taking out the trash was ultimate fear for me because okay. who's hiding oh. in the bushes? Oh, I can only imagine. Uh, you know, and like being alone, like or if my, you know, uh, I was. I remember this one time. Um, shortly after, uh, I was going to be picked up by a neighbor friend and taken, I don't know, to a haunted house or something random. And there was going to be a 10 minute window from when my parents left and I was home alone versus when these people were going to come to pick me up. And I was like, I can make it 10 minutes. We can do it. I'll be alone, but I'll be all fine. That 10 minute mark hit. And this was my first ever panic attack. I didn't understand what was happening, but, Mm -hmm. um, I just, that 10 minute mark hit, where are they? where are they? And 11. Oh my God, what's going on? And I physiologically, I started having, right. I'm feeling it right now, yeah. actually. Attack. Yeah. At 10, I didn't know. I don't know what this is. Yeah. I, yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm freaking out. I'm crying. I'm trying to talk myself down. They'll be here soon. I'm calling them on the rotary phone. Where are you guys? You know, but they're not here. They're, right. And eventually when she came 17 minutes late, I was hysterical. Oh. What's wrong, honey? I just, I couldn't explain it. It's yeah. like, what am I going to say? I'm alone. And that scared me. Like, duh. And then, because then I would be like, Jessica, you're being so stupid right now. What's going on? But, and then I didn't tell anybody because I didn't want to get sent to the nut house. And so <laughs> I keep it all to myself. And, you know, and then I finally would calm down. But I never understood that that was a problem. I just thought that this is how people operate. Right. I don't know. Exactly. You know? Yeah, I, nothing right. to compare it to. Right. Yeah. And so, 
there was early level. And this was, I mean, I lived in a time where when I went to school, I was afraid someone was going to come through the window and shoot me. Um, now every child mm-hmm. feels that way. Yeah. No one was feeling that way in 91. I know what that feels like. It's horrible. It's scary. It's terrifying. Yeah. I'm trying to, I can't focus on what's going on on the chalkboard because I'm literally worried that either a paparazzi is out there trying to take my picture or someone's going to come in and shoot me. Well, so- Constant Boy, there's fear. So much there. And, and well, so that's, we get to the paparazzi. Well, well let's, <laughs> yeah, oh my God, so let's, we'll get to the paparazzi. You know? We will. We'll get to everything. My guaranteed, God. guaranteed. But the uh, the the key takeaway in this conversation for our audience is to understand this is what trauma looks like. Completely normal. Mm-hmm. I I want to I want to express to people that. Just recognizing that this craziness and your panic attacks, completely Mm -hmm. normal. That in and of itself is part of the healing process to realize I'm not, uh, this is how the human brain works. The human brain is magnificent at survival. Mm -hmm. Okay. The, you know, our evolution, you know, was a process of survival. It's not of thriving. We're going to get to that. That's abnormal. That's an abnormal stage to go from there to doing something phenomenal like you're doing now in your life. Mm -hmm. But in that we're, we're in the dive stage and all this going on. So I want to kind of break it apart a little bit before we get to the paparazzi and ask you. So we've talked about shock. How about anger? Were you feeling anger? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And who are you angry about? Amy Fisher. Okay. Yeah. My dad at this point was not the villain. Okay. She was the villain that came into my life and messed everything. Destroyed it. So when did you first hear the name Amy Fisher? Oh, good question. I don't remember that. Okay. And that's okay. <laughs> Not necessarily that, first. That, and that's okay because that's part of trauma. Right. Right. You know, the, the memory is. It's a defense is, mechanism. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you were made, mad at Amy Fisher for obvious reasons. Mm-hmm. She shot your mom in the head. Right. Um, who else were you angry with? Nobody. Just okay, her. Okay, just her. Mm-hmm. Okay. And if that, and um, this might be another trauma response because of all this, um, you know, I felt the need to be perfect and look fine at all times. And sure. anger was not an emotion. I allowed myself to So it was show. internal okay. anger. It was yes. You weren't throwing furniture. No, I was, I've never been the physical fight in my life. Okay. <laughs> Still to this day, I okay. think if I were faced, I could kick some ass. Well, the day's, the day's not over. <laughs> <laughs> um, I can be very strong with my words and intimidating mm-hmm. with my, my presence, but um. I, I just, anger was something I saved for sports. I made sure it was a pro, like I was a terror on the basketball court. I was a terror on the <laughs> lacrosse team. I'd be kicking everybody's ass. <laughs> I had so much anger, but I got it out appropriately it, Yeah, because anger was not an emotion. Like when this all happened, like the last thing my family needed was a problem right. or something that wasn't just pleasant. Mm-hmm. And so I took um, upon myself to be perfect and happy and lovely and delightful at all costs, at all times of the day. Even if I physically inside didn't feel that way, okay. I made sure to present on the outside. Okay. And I so. think what people don't really understand is that anger is very, it's a very healthy emotion. It's just like, okay, you're going to mm-hmm. punch a wall. You're going to punch a person. Or are you going to go exercise, you know, go to the gym, lacrosse, swim, or whatever mm-hmm. that is. Right. But I want people to understand how important it is to feel anger. And but process in a, it. Yeah. And process it and to be, you know, have it be appropriate. But you also mentioned like the five stages of grief. Well, I, yeah. Oh, so, yeah. so just quickly, you know, when I coach people through grief counseling, it's like, okay, well, I, I was at stage four, but now I'm back at stage one. So yeah. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross is very linear when really it's grief and trauma is a massive yeah. roller coaster. I'm so glad you said that because my book has the five stages of grief as chapters. And we're going to go through each quote chapter, each step with, with your story. But I'm so glad you said that, Tanya, because the f- the phrase I've come up with is rinse and repeat. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you know, you think you're in the thrive stage, and then there's some days you revisit the anger right. and you're mm-hmm. pissed about it. Yeah, totally normal. And you hit the nail on the head. All of this is totally normal, and it's not linear. You're right. You're, you're right. It's, it, a it's messy roller coaster. It, it's, it's yeah. It's tangled up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you, okay. So for example, like myself and some other people that I've worked with where it's like, oh my God, you know what I did today? I left my car running and the door was open and I spent eight hours at work. 
it's like, that's okay. It's, it's okay. normal. Oh my gosh. So now fun. I'm putting the milk in the cabinet. It's like, that's okay. <laughs> you know, All it's good. like, I know it's okay. You know, because yeah, that's what trauma does. Okay. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It, it great. Makes great you, point. Makes and you I'm do funny you things. That up too, because I'm still on a process of healing and I'm making significant progress every day, yeah. but there are certain times where I feel like I've maybe taken two steps back. And for me, the perfectionist side of me says, ah, fuck it. Let's yeah. just forget it all that I've yeah. done. And it's, it makes me almost want to stop and self-sabotage. Yeah. But then hearing mm-hmm. something like that, like you're going to maybe take two steps back, but keep going. It's okay. Exactly. It's yeah. an important message for people to heal. Because yeah. sometimes people just go, oh, well, I tried eh, and, and then just self-destruct. Yeah. You know? Right. Wow. Okay. Well, you're saying things better than I have to go back and rewrite my book. <laughs> said some things better than I said. There's but you're absolutely two going on no, right. So we talked about shock. We talked about anger. Couldn't agree with both of you. Bargaining. Did you bargain with the police, bargain with your family, bargain with anybody? Was bargaining part of your process? I think I bargained with God a lot. Okay. Mm-hmm. Great. Talk, Which is talk true. to us about that. Um, yeah. you know, I yeah, I That's think it thing. was, you know, if you just get my mom through this, I'll study hard and get an A on this test. If you get my dad not in jail, I'll do this. If you can help my brother not do drugs, I'll do this. You know, it was a lot, I think, of bargaining that way because it was so out of my control okay. that I couldn't necessarily bargain with the players at hand because right. I'm mm-hmm. a child and everyone else is an adult. <clears throat> but like, I felt like I could get some power with bargaining with God. And so when it went my way in quotes, uh-huh. it made me feel powerful. I'm like, right. yes. Okay. Yeah. I got, I got this God, God thing, guy, you know, yeah. it's like now I have such a different, I don't use God in that way anymore. It's not about begging and asking and wishing. Yeah. Um, it's more about thanking and, and yeah. And, giving gratitude. Right. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. Well I think that was cause I grew up in a Catholic family. I was, you know, baptized communion, altar girl, church choir. My mother is named after Mary and Joseph. She went to Catholic school, but it's that Catholic God, right? <laughs> it's it's that <laughs> Doesn't get more Catholic than that. Mary Jo, honestly. I'm like, Mary Jo, that. married after Mary. <laughs> See. Like, legit. <laughs> so, oh, yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Awesome. Uh, you know, awesome. even, even this is like a hopeful message for people like, you know, after trauma, once you, once you, you know, go through the process and you're healing, you find, you find some sort of humor in it because this is really yes. heavy. You laugh or you're crying. Yeah. You you find it while you're going through it yeah. too. It doesn't yeah. just happen yeah. after. Humor got our family through a lot, a lot. of this stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. and that's, that's a good message, yeah. you know, in, you know the, in the words of great Led Zeppelin, does anybody remember laughter? Does anyone remember laughter? Yeah. I mean, and, and we had to, like, you know, so when the paparazzi started coming and they'd do a live segment in front of our house, we'd be on the bed with my sick mother and my dad and my brother and I watching the live news. Okay. Look at our house, look at that. <laughs> and my dad would go run over to the light switch and he'd go watch this and he'd turn the light switch <laughs> off and the lights went off on the TV and then we'd turn it back on, the lights went off. <laughs> oh like, my God. To the live news. So you're playing a game. Show. Right, we're making it fun. But then my aunt calls and she's like, I, heard, I saw the lights flickering. What's the matter? Is it Morse code? Are you guys like, <laughs> <laughs> weird little moments like that? Uh, that even made us uh, laugh because we're neurotic Anna. And of course she's worried. Of course she's watching the news and thinks that it's is Morse code for help. <laughs> like, funny. I don't know. Just trying to have fun, make light of this. Sit- you know, we did that. We did that with Sydney and Justin. Yeah. You know, because the helicopters were all over our yeah. house, and it ended up being we did like Michael Jackson moments. Remember when he put the Blankets. put the blanket over his kids right so that's what we do with the kids like okay come on we're gonna hide right yeah. we made it a game right. you know and yeah. and being a kid it's like my mom being in the war too where the bombs are dropping and it was like Battlestar Galactica or whatever it is that that game mm-hmm. where it was like oh the bombs are coming let's run let's play a game right it's like it's a, <sighs> it's a coping skill it's a coping correct skill. and yeah. a defense mechanism mm-hmm. yeah. right mm-hmm. okay so you're bargaining with God you're uh, not bargaining with your family per se um, how about, um, depression? Did that play into this? Not until my thirties. Really? Not until episode 49. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, it runs in my family, uh-huh. uh, my mother's side. I never understood it. Um, I'd be like, just smile, <laughs> get over it. You know, um, that I'd never had, I never allowed myself to do that. And there was no time for that. Okay. that. That would mean I'm not perfect. And that would mean, you know, and so it didn't hit me until, um, 
pretty much 30, 35. So is it fair to say, correct me if I'm wrong, is it fair to say that kind of the Catholic perfectionist culture was kind of the preeminent thing? Keep, keep the mask on in terms of the facade, you know, more so than the, the Catholic part of it. I think it was just, you know, I saw how big this was meaning, you know, the, a sea of paparazzi out front, my parents acting in certain ways, what it did to my family, what it did to our neighborhood. I saw the vastness of it. And so I just, you know, wanted to not be a problem. I didn't want to add to anything. So you just wanted to be a good kid. Yes. Yeah, so you just yeah. wanted to be a keep good the kid. Peace, make people happy, you know, joke, yeah. laugh mm-hmm. like that. That was my role. And so depression didn't fit in that. Okay. It, you know, yeah. well, we'll get to that. Then. Yeah. Fit so that, let's but. get to the paparazzi. This, I mean, all these folks showing up mm-hmm. on your front lawn, talk about it. Well, I mean, in this weird messed up sort of way, I grew up wanting to be like Britney Spears. Like I was convinced I was going to be <laughs> discovered at the mall and taken to Broadway and play Annie. Okay. <laughs> and so like, this was before, you know, the cameras came and my, my house, my name became a household name. So it's almost like, be careful what you wish for. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because all of a sudden, you don't know how it's going to show up. Right. And <laughs> so, um, when my family was telling me, you know, when you get back home, there's going to be people with news cameras up there, you yeah. know, there's probably going to be a lot of them just, you know, and I was just like, perfect. <laughs> you know, I was like, it's my time to get to showtime. Oh, wow. Right. I was like, I don't have to try so hard at the mall. They're literally at my house. <laughs> And so I took it upon myself to try to get discovered for a while. Um, And so when like, when the paparazzi would be outside, I knew that five o'clock is live news time. So I was like, it's showtime. And so I would sneak out of my house and my costume and bring a boom box and like put it on the front lawn. I was like five o'clock, boom, press Whitney Houston. I'm ever, I'm every woman and would do like full on cartwheels and like dance routines and like, look at me, someone take me to Broadway. And then I did my finish like, and like the reporters would just come up to me. They're like, little girl, can you go play somewhere else? We're about to start a live news segment. And I was just like, did they just not see that cartwheel into a split? Like, hello. Oh my so gosh. I remember now developing this love hate relationship with the paparazzi because eventually like they were the same people there every time. So AJ Benza, you're there every day. Like I, I got to know the Long Island local news people. And so they would know me too. And they're like, can you go play somewhere else? We're trying to do our live segment. I was like, can you do your job somewhere else? This is my lawn. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's my house. Get out of here. And then I go up to them and and like, oh my God, you're such a great reporter. Can I have your autograph? And then they'd write their autograph and I'd rip it up in front of them. Oh my like, goodness. That sucks. And it's fine. Like, it became this. So weird, you actually like, went out and confronted them like as a nine-year-old like, little girl. They infiltrated our neighborhood too. Uh-huh. Yeah. And so yeah. My friends, we'd go, we'd go, we knew all the back ways. We'd cut, we'd go get eggs and we'd go, how do you like your eggs? And egg them <laughs> and throw eggs at the news vans or water balloons. And like, that's they, anger. There you go. That could be anger. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, but it was fun, you know, yeah. we were, it was making like, a game of it. Yeah. You know? And so we kind of had that, at least the kids in the neighborhood, that's the relationship I kind of had um, with the paparazzi. But I do remember them just, just sometimes sitting out my window and just staring at them. They're like they're so invasive. Mm-hmm. And I would just sit in my window as a 10 year old with mi- both middle fingers up and being like, well, they can't use this on TV. Yeah, right. And so I just like, <laughs> stop, stop coming to my house. Stop. Yeah. For what? Like, I remember one time my aunt came to visit and the trash truck was happened to be right around the corner. And so my aunt asked the trash guys like, hey, y'all mind driving this truck and blocking the view so I can get into my sister's house? And so they're like, yeah, of course. So she jumped on the back of a trash truck like a trash man. Oh, and my God. They gave her a ride. They stopped in front of all the cameras. My aunt was able to come into the house without making it on the live news later. Um, you know, and it was just like random scenes like that. And we ordered a pizza. I went and paid for it. And they're like, oh, pizza at the Butterfuco house. Like, it's a pizza. We're hungry. You know, like <laughs> we couldn't go out to dinner after that point yeah. because we were so known. And if we did go out, people would bark at us or people would mm-hmm. yell at us or people would shout at us. And it was scary and terrifying. And like, so eventually we just had to kind of stay at home. And How long yeah. does this thing go on for with the paparazzi? I mean, still happening, but the major oh, well. paparazzi like that until Tanya's tragedy happened. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. You're talking about that. Because yeah. once the shooting yeah. happened the, and the um, the cameras were there for that, uh, then it became my dad wound up going on trial. And so they were there for 
um, a, a statutory rape. And so they were there for that. And so like they were always at our house. Okay. Wow. Okay. So when I want to talk about your dad. For and, your, oh, and before that happens yeah. too, I also want to shout like, and y'all had a gate at your house. I remember we had this conversation. That's what, okay. I was thinking that. how lovely it was. She had a gate. Oh yeah. So that was, yeah. Uh, we didn't have that. And so yeah. they were constantly. The gold well, they were on PCH, weren't they? Yeah. The so we lived um, at a major, or we did live at a major intersection of Pacific Coast Highway and Monarch Bay Drive. So we had protesters, we had supporters mm -hmm. on all four corners, but then we have a restaurant right across the street, which is now Salt Creek Grill. And that, that was an empty parking lot. So all the news vans were parking over there, satelliting, you know, mm -hmm. their, their stuff, picking up our conversations in, inside the house. If we wanted to have any conversation, we would have to go down on the beach. Mm -hmm. So it oh, wasn't. Yeah, because they were eavesdropping. Yeah. Too. They were tapping our phone They were tapping in. Then. They had their satellites to hear private conversations. Uh -huh. Like media in the Same 90s thing. was so exploitative and so ruthless. Yeah. 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 Like it, it became so insane with that. And that's also my fear of exploitation yeah. for that. Yeah, for sure. Because <laughs> literally neighbors and families and friends were selling home videos for thousands of dollars. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We're coming in mic'd up for thousands of dollars. Rico, uh -huh. fuck Rico. Uh -huh. Oh my God. I still, I don't, I've never had a successful um, relationship because I am too afraid someone's going to pretend to fall in love with me to exploit me. Yeah. That's exactly what wow. happened. So Rico. And when you said it yep. out loud, I said, that's validated. Yep. Sorry, Dr. Deb. No. You got a few more <laughs> sessions, honey. <laughs> she's, there, she's my yep. therapist and she was frustrated my inability to trust someone in such an intimate way like that. And that took wow. time for me to trust after that. So Rico was posing basically as news media reporting news back to Mexico City. And was basically saying, Tanya, you know, come live with me, yada, yada, yada. We built this great relationship, but then he ended up being a news reporter for, for Telemundo or something so like that. So they're trying every little trick in the book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I got it. Going through our mail, going through our yeah. Yeah. lot of parallels here between, between us, for yeah. sure. Yeah. And it's something about that 90s exploitative mm -hmm. occurred affair. Everyone yeah. wants to scoop, you know, and they were paying a lot of money. So people's morals really came out. Exactly. People's characters really came out. Because it there really were some does. friends yeah. that were offered and said, absolutely not. Yeah. yeah. Mary Joe and Joey all the way, you know. And yeah. so it's, it's, it's. And you're like, and I, you and I are both lucky in that way because a lot of Nicole's friends, they didn't come forward and, you know, say that, but the people at the cemetery, the homes mm. that, that outline or that back up the Nicole cemetery where Nicole's buried, um, those families got tons of money to have news, news reporters coming in to film the, uh, From their the funeral. Cards. Yeah. Very wow. exploitive. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Invasive. Very, very. And as a 10 year old seeing that. Oh, I could only imagine. I just, you know, this yeah. is how the world works. Yeah. Forget it. Yeah. I'm well, not participating in that. Oh, if I fall in love, someone's either going to cheat on me and then kill me yeah. or sexually exploit me in the media. Nah. Yeah. Don't touch me. I'm cool. Yeah. <laughs> what's, There's what's, a lot of underlying. What's interesting is you kind of, you kind of uh, alternate between here's the paparazzi. I'll show off and do cartwheels to throwing eggs at them and right. hating mm -hmm. on their guts. Well, when they didn't discover me, I started hating. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you're useless. <laughs> yeah. 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 I mean, to, to have both of you in the room at the same time talking about yeah. what it's like to be uh, in your case, a child as you as a young lady uh, with this, high intense media where every little thing and even things that don't happen are invented. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. when I was working on the Heaven's Gate case, there was a party in the backyard. And then it came out that there was a party in the backyard, a birthday party for one of the kids and I, and the national Enquirer. So I don't normally buy the national Enquirer, but I bought it. And I read the story. I was at the party. Mm -hmm. I know what happened. Mm -hmm. And they're talking about ghosts and flickering candle or some kind of BS story. And I thought that never happened, but they were, they were at, the media was in that case. They were getting the kids in that neighborhood to talk about what'd you see at the party? You yeah. know, and yeah. you know how kids are, they make stuff up mm -hmm. yeah. or, or everything's sensationalized. Right. But yeah. then people read that and that's yeah. what they, and they believe. believe. And now it's a snowball. And yeah. then all of a sudden my name, everybody knows it's a big joke yep. on everywhere. People are talking about it at school. People are talking about the restaurant. People are talking about it. That's the what they office, believe. My dance class. Every, it was inescapable. Uh, yeah. yeah. And I remember reading in the news that you were actually, Actually on the set of Saturday Night Live oh, and yes. Madonna was there. Can you share the, because we're talking about the, the Madonna incident. The, the Madonna incident. <laughs> I do not know about this. Oh, oh yeah. Girl. Well, here we go. Ooh, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, let me fix my hair. <laughs> um, so basically 
92, Madonna was my queen. All right. This is the Immaculate Collection. I was voguing my nine-year-old life. Ten, I was 10 by this time, fourth grade. <laughs> but living, like Madonna is ultimate supreme, you know? Mm, right. And so I had, I was in the habit of watching Saturday Night Live by then because they had started parodying my dad. And yeah. so like we would watch it and like Danny DeVito is playing my dad. And we're like, look how funny that is, you know, in some weird way. But then they had promoted Madonna is going to be the musical guest in a few weeks. And I was like, this is my chance, you know? <laughs> and so I was like, dad, I know you could hook it up because things fall off the back of the truck with him, you know? And so like, and I, my rational brain was, well, they talk about him. So I know he knows them. I'm sure he can hook me up with Madonna tickets, you know, some, something like that. And so my mother was adamant against it of like, are you kidding me? They, they make fun of us every week. You're going to send our child there. Absolutely not. But you know, she was on a lot of pills and she was uh, hurt. And my dad wanted to, you know, give me what I wanted. And so he hooked up tickets. And so we took a limousine. I like got my lace on. I was ready <laughs> for Madonna. Wait, wait, is this going to the concert or Saturday Night Saturday Live? Saturday Night Live okay. taping. In, okay. uh, in probably in New York, right? In New York City. Yeah, right. So we took a limo, like it was a big thing. And well, I'm sitting in the audience and I think my Aunt Eileen was there, but I don't remember that, but she tells me she was, so I believe her. Um, but um, for some reason, my dad wasn't sitting with me. I don't know if he was either backstage or what, but he wasn't there. So you're by yourself right now. With a friend and my aunt. Okay. And our limo driver. And okay. just just real quickly to interject, you were at this point on really good terms with your dad. Yeah. Okay. Gotcha. Absolutely. Yeah. So yeah. go ahead. I'm, I was daddy's girl for a very long time okay. until the veil was lifted. Okay. We'll um, get to that, but go ahead. And so I'm in the audience and I don't know, it's a sketch show. I'm 10. I'm not understanding what's going on. I'm just like, where's Madonna? And so finally she came out at like the halfway mark. And it was a very um, dark, it was very like cabaret, single spotlight. She had like a black turtleneck on, blonde, comes out. And I was like, <gasps> <It's recorded." laughs> you know, I was so excited. This is freaking Madonna right here. Material girl, girl. Madonna in the flesh, not a drag queen. <laughs> Madonna. She was really, really close to you, like 20 you know, feet away. 20 feet away. It yeah. was a small audience. I was it's not. It's small. It's far. a small studio. And so before she starts singing, she comes out and we're like, yes, Madonna, oh my God. And then she like holds up a picture from behind her back and like holds it in the audience. And it was like eight by 11, you know, printer paper, but I couldn't see what was on it because there was like a glare from the lights on it. And then all of a sudden I like focus on the picture and it's a picture of my dad's face. <laughs> and I was just like, you know, of like, why is Madonna holding a picture of my dad, not your dad, not this guy's dad, you know, my dad out of any dad on the planet. She's holding my dad's face. How does Madonna know my dad? What's going on? And then all of a sudden she goes, fight the enemy and just rips it into a million pieces. And my eyes get big. The audience just starts hooting, hollering, laughing. And I just remember that is not funny. And just being like, well, it was a bit that Sinead O'Connor had done a couple of weeks ago with the Pope's picture. Oh, that's right. So they were trying to like parody that moment. But when you hear your ultimate idol call your dad the enemy. Yeah. Not yeah. an asshole. Yeah. Not a jerk. Yeah. The, the enemy. enemy. And to have an entire Ooh. room of people. Laugh at it. Laugh and hoot and holler and agree. And I just remember sitting there and looking around and just seeing that. And just almost like it was slow motion or like frozen in time. And I just remember the thoughts in my brain of like, do they know I'm his kid? Do they know I'm right here? Mm -hmm. Does Madonna know I'm here? Daddy, what'd you do to Madonna? Like all these <laughs> thoughts are going through my mind. Yeah. And I'm like, would they still be laughing if they knew I was right here? Um, and I just remember like being shocked and, and deflated and just like another one of those, like, this is my ultimate queen who just betrayed me and I didn't do anything wrong. And, and you're 10 years and, old. And I'm yeah. 10. And my, I think my aunt was like, oh, it's just a joke, honey. And I was just like, yeah, I know. Not so right. funny. And I just sat there and I've never liked Madonna since. And yeah. anytime her music comes on, I go, ugh. Yeah, I don't blame you. It's a shame. Yeah. Apparently she's a trash. I tell you, yeah, I well, totally matter, relate to it. Fuck. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> At 10. <laughs> yeah. You yeah. know, and so it was really... Traumatizing. Yeah. Well, yeah. 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 I think it's, it's, that was it's like disappointing moments. more so. Disappointing. But I also think that was one of those defining moments of this thing is big mm -hmm. for Madonna to know my dad, not a drag queen Madonna at a brunch. This is the Madonna on Saturday night live with an audience of people who all feel that way. Mm -hmm. 
And that to me was the moment everyone on earth feels that way. That's sad. And that's even when yeah. I became under the microscope in my own mind mm. more. And I needed to be even more perfect. And I needed to be the leader of the team and the, the, the lead of the school play. I can't just be in the play. I have to be the best at it, you know? And that's when I really, cause I saw how hated my father was. And I knew that I'm so much not that way. And I need to prove now to the world that this apple fell very far from that tree. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really when those, those themes really started for me in that life of everybody hates my family. Everybody hates my dad. And at that time, everybody hated my mom for staying with them and defending them. And so they were making fun of her. Oh. They were taping their face down, making fun of a, a gun violence victim saying, I stand with my man on Saturday Night Live. Oh my and it's God. Like, See, we wouldn't treat people like that now in yeah. media, but seeing that as a kid, Really fuck me up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and like, you know, even even today when I see things like that, because it's still out there, they oh, yeah. still make fun of people, but it's like any time because I'm sensitive to that too, even today yeah. at 52 years old. Well, I saw your reaction with Kim Kardashian on Sorry I'm oh. live doing that bullshit and yeah. her, you know, opening monologue. We still yeah. deal with it yeah. to this day. Yeah. That was recent too. Yeah, yeah that was a couple that months Kim ago. That Kim Kardashian thing was real recent. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that was bad. Yeah. Tacky. And I, I had talked to you kind of behind the scenes, and I and that that affects you. Yeah. What people forget is behind every statistic. Right. There's a family. People. Right. And, and kids and people. Yes. And I think too, growing up, I had a lot of those moments, um, unexpected, traumatic, that, 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 rattled my my everything because like um i'd go to the movie theater just to see a movie with my friends we're going to see the adams family too you know woohoo! and then there's a scene in that movie when they're exchanging serial killer cards yeah. and they go oh i'll trade you amy fisher and so i'm in the movie theater with my friends and the person that murdered almost murdered my mom is on the big screen now and i go zing you know and i'm 12 then mm -hmm. or i'm watching an episode of friends and they're trying to figure out what to name phoebe's baby and right he goes oh what do you name him joey and they make, oh, well, Joey Buttafuoco really ruined that name for us. Yeah. And it was like, and I was 15. Oh, I so relate you know? to this. And so every, <laughs> at every year and every stage of my life, um, a Buttafuoco joke will come out of the blue or a Buttafuoco reference will come out of the blue. And for me, that just triggers. I got the whole notebook of mom shot in the face, dad in jail, uh, paparazzi, you know, news vans. And it's just as I've, I've gotten better because I've done a lot of healing, but the, the PTSD chain would yeah. always get activated every time that would come. And so that's why I was so fearful and had so much PTSD too, because I never knew where it was coming from. Mm -hmm. okay. It could come from the media. It could come from a movie. It could come from, I mean, I was in college at UCSB. I'm taking a law class and they had this um, concept <laughs> called the aesthetication of the real. <laughs> and I'm reading this concept and it's about when normal things blow up into big proportions. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden I'm reading my homework and I see my parents' picture. Uh -huh. And so I had to go to my professor and say, hey, could you maybe use a different example? Because this is my family and I really don't want to talk about in front of 500 students at UCSB today, you know? And so it was just like, it's always kind of been a constant theme of my life. And I've always just walked around with the feeling I'm about to be punched in the face uh -huh. um, or the gut, you know? Mm -hmm. And only recently have I taken control of my narrative and be cleared out the shame and the guilt and stuff mm -hmm. around it. Um, mm -hmm. We'll get to that, you know, in a future right. episode. Right. Um, but the, this moment that now that we're talking about this early childhood, this, this constant, I don't know what angle this is coming from on every plane of existence, whether it's real life, school, work or home mm -hmm. or media, you know, right. even 10, 11, 12, 13, like it was always there. Yeah. So what we're seeing here, I mean, to kind of put it into clinical terms, because I want to get to your relationship with your dad here next, but what we're seeing is that there's an acute trauma where you realize your mom's seriously hurt. You're being lied. That's the shock. Mm -hmm. But then there's this chronic, constant layered fallout right. that is to this day. I mean, just a mm -hmm. short time ago with Kim Kardashian and your mm -hmm. thing, Tanya, and and, you know, with your experience at UF, uh, UC Santa Barbara, where it just keeps kind of coming in waves. Mm -hmm. And it's like, can I just get a break yeah. from this stuff? <laughs> right. and, and that's uh, how trauma no. works. <laughs> it's yeah. you you know, always there. there. And the, and the cause I, same thing with my little trauma that, which never made the newspaper with having the heart surgery, which was, and, and the real, I think the heart surgery was actually er easier than learning about it. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. um, I can imagine mm -hmm. that. You know what? And and the emotional side of it is far worse than the physical side. 
because uh, phys- I, I was healed up in a summer. Mm-hmm. I did miss the summer at the beach, but I was healed physically. Mm-hmm. The doctors did a great job, but you get a slap on the back and emotionally there's zero prep, zero training, zero right. insight, and you live with it for the rest of your life. Uh, and in my case, it lasted for decades, mm-hmm. you know, unresolved trauma. Mm-hmm. So, and, and it sounds like similar kind of parallels with your story. You get nailed with this stuff. And then this layered thing with Madonna doing her thing. I'm sure Madonna is a wonderful person, but she's I don't not. think, she's well, maybe she's not. not. I don't, I, maybe I'm not. I've heard from a maybe few I'm people not. she's not. Okay, whatever. <laughs> well, she's diva. I mean, maybe no. she's dealing with trauma. We'll have her on and figure it out. But 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 the thing is, it, she certainly owes you an apology. There's no question about we'll that. We'll never get it. No. Well, I mean, and at this point, like owing apology, you know, yeah. she was a bit, the writers wrote her a bit to do and she did it. You know? I, I get it. Even I get it. think I got an but, apology from Kim? Yeah. Right? We'll never get it. No. Yeah, that's probably no. true. But yeah. my point is, is that is that that this is this chronic trauma, whether intended yeah. innocently or maliciously. There's this ongoing trauma yeah. that you have to deal with. When we talk about, you know, the survival stage, we'll talk about how de- how to deal with it. But right now, where it's hurting, I think I think I get it. Mm-hmm. I think the audience should get it. That here's people behind the statistics, a totally innocent little ten year old girl in the audience excited to see her idol come out on stage and trash your dad uh, and your, and, and make you yourself feel like you're hated and a bad person. That's, right. that's horrific. That's not cool. Well, Cause no. I also thought, you know, this is my dad, this is my bloodline. So if people like, am I like that? Is this me? Is you know, this like, in my DNA? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I get it. All those questions are going through your yeah. mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I want to ask you about your relationship with your dad. It's complicated. Yeah. I currently do not talk to him. I haven't talked to him in a few years. Okay. Um, but at this point in time, the die of stage, he was my hero. He okay. was my number one, um, you know, life of the party. The dad that I knew was not the dad that was painted in the media. And so it was easy for me to not believe that because mm-hmm. I'm like, y'all don't, y'all don't know. Y'all yeah. don't know him. I know him. I'm here every day, you know, and, and he is, he's social. He's great. Like he is very charismatic, um, you know, and that kind of thing. Now I've the work I've done looking back on it, you know, he didn't mean no favors. Um, because even as I continued to grow, he either just threw money at me or, um, you know, didn't do much to help me emotionally at, at all. And actually his actions just continued to fuck my world up more mm. and more. Okay. And so, um, at, you know, I think towards, uh, college is when I really started to wake up to being like, maybe he's not a good guy. So tell us about that. I mean, we're talking about the dive stage. When did you have that awakening that, Hey, my dad's had a double life well, and maybe what I've seen is not the true dad. Before I get to that. Okay. Um, I think it's important to note when the first time he was in jail, he's been in four for my whole life. Um, I remember the first time going to have to visit him. Um, and my poor mother has already been enough, you know, she schleps me and my brother there. And this was also one of those moments of, I think like nobody's on this guy's side. So I need to be kind Mm. of thing. Um, as I'm waiting in the jail, waiting for him, I tried to smuggle my school picture because it was a few days before Christmas. And I tried to mail it to him earlier in the week, but I was told I'm not allowed to put stickers on the envelope because that's how drug dealers get drugs into jail at 10 years old. That's how I'm learning how to you know, get drugs Whoa. in the jail. They, they go on the stickers and an envelope. So they don't let that. And I was like, we'll see about that. And so I wrote him a letter and I loaded every sticker I had on it. Like all of the Lisa Frank, everything like that. I was like, it's, I'm not putting drugs. Yeah. They'll know You're it's 10. from me. <laughs> well, it got sent right back. Never got to him. I was like, damn it. Um, and so I was determined to get him my school picture. And so we were going to visit and I had my school picture in my pocket. I was going to smuggle it to him. Um, but as I'm waiting for him to come out this like double door kind of a thing, um, on the other side of those double doors was like a special prisoner visiting unit. And on this side, I see two serial killers on either side that were in. <laughs> he was about to take a drink. He stopped. <laughs> 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 and they were prolific serial killers of the time because I noticed I recognized them from the news because they would talk about them. They would talk about my family. And then they talk about the other serial killer, one of which his name was Joel Rifkin. And at that time, oh, he was a major serial killer. He killed like 17 prostitutes. That name sounds familiar. He, he was a 91, 92. Um, the cops found him at a, as a, uh, they pulled him over for speeding and they found a bunch of prostitutes dead in his, his trunk. And it oh, turns Jesus. out he killed like 17 women. Wow. Him and his mom and my mom said hello in the waiting room. 
And so he's over here waiting for his prisoner over here. And there's another guy named Colin Ferguson who's over here. And he had shot up the Long Island Railroad in a mass shooting in 91 or 92. And so, and this was before mass shooting. So it was like a big deal. And so I just remember going into like deep thought of like, my dad is in here with these guys. Like my dad didn't even do anything. He, he told me, my dad just told me that they were going to put him in jail anyway. And so they, he just said he was guilty. So he'd only go in for a, a few months. So he'd come out and put the responsibility on me that, oh, I, I did this so I can watch you grow up. And so I felt guilty that he was even in there in the first place. Oh, wow. And now to see him, like, I it just, I, I was, I'm a very deep thinker. I always have been. I, I can, you know, go down the rabbit hole and spin out really easy. And I always have. And so I just remember seeing these serial killers and being like, my dad's in here like with these guys, How like frightening, terrifying. But then I remembered, I was like, my dad can kick both those asses, you know, like, he's a big guy. but then I would visualize, I was like, are they playing kickball together at recess? And are they swapping sandwiches at lunch? Like I just would go off into these worlds and like, what? And then my dad would send me presents, you know, visiting or from, from handmade, like bartered with a pack of cigarettes, he'd send me like a, a cross made out of burgundy tube sock, like thread, yeah. from a tube sock. Or I remember he sent me this like beautiful handkerchief that had this like adorable teddy bear with butterflies, like airbrushed on in a meadow with my name in the clouds. And my mother got it framed and put it on my wall. So I would think of my dad, blah, 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 blah. But all I remember thinking about was like a murderer made that like, a rapist made that like someone that's capable of making something so beautiful and pretty could also do something bad enough to wind up in jail. Mm -hmm. And I remember that also messed with my brain of like, people aren't what they seem. Someone who's really nice can be a murderer and someone Mm -hmm. who's a murderer is capable of making beautiful things. And I just remember being like, what is going I just, this is so I can't real. imagine yeah. just being so, a small kid. Yeah. You yeah. see in and the never jail, telling anyone any of this. I, I just want to recap this because this is, this is genuinely mind blowing. Your dad walks out, here's your dad. And on either side, you see people you recognize from the news mm-hmm. for being mass murders mm-hmm. on either side. Yeah. And this is real life in person. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> and so then when he comes out and he, you know, we say, I tried to give him a hug and they yell at me because you're not allowed to touch over the border. And um, I had tried to like get, take my picture out of my pocket and like slide it over like a deal, you know, at the bouncer at the club. Like, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and my dad, cause he always breaks the rules. So I was like, he'll take it. And he's like, oh no, honey, I can't have that. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, um, they, you know, they search me. And I was like, what do you mean? Just put it in your pocket. He's like, no, they strip search me. Yeah. And I was like, what's that mean? So that's how I learned what a strip search was. And uh. like that, um, you know, actually I said something about, yeah, they make you take all your clothes off and they, you know, you have to, you know, yep. bend over and they check your butt. And I was like, who do want to hide things in their butt? You know, <laughs> and he, he was like a lot of people, a lot actually. of people, <laughs> a lot of people. And so just, you know, life lessons. Um, <laughs> a lot of people. How old are you when you're learning about this? 10. Can you believe oh, that? that fourth, fifth grade. I mean, as a 20 something year old that, yeah. you know, yeah. in our, in where we are now, we get it, yeah. but it's like, wow, at 10 years old. And, and just right. a recap. And, but that made me feel, I'm never going to come and visit my dad again because it's degrading. He has to strip naked every time someone, a visitor comes and do that whole process. I, so every time after that, I have visited him. I just pictured him, you know, having to get butt naked and his butt <laughs> shirt, shirt. Oh. And I just felt guilty that I had to put him through that, you know, not even thinking, well, you put yourself in there, son, you know? Like I wasn't right. there, uh, you know, whatever. But okay, I just so, okay. I just want to recap wow. real quick. Uh, you said your dad went to jail four times. I knew he went to jail. I didn't know he was. Yeah. Was this all after Amy Fisher? Yes. Okay. So if you can just quickly recap what the four things were sure. that he went to jail for. So after Amy's plea bargain went through, um, they put my dad on some sort of. I don't know if it was a trial or what court, some sort of court proceeding for a statutory rape, um, which he took a plea for. And so, but he said he didn't do it. Right. But I'm taking a plea because the cops were threatening him that he's going to be in jail for the rest of his life. Blah blah blah. So that's number one. So that's number one. Uh, He got out. He came to California, solicited a prostitute, got caught, violated his probation. So he went back in jail. That's number two. College, college. Yeah, he stayed out of jail for a while until college. Um, and he was, well, this was fun. I mean, <laughs> I was home from winter break. 
um, and woken up by the SWAT team at 7.30 in the morning. So, so like number 40 three. people with full guns. And yeah, and they, I was held captive for about eight hours, not able to call my mom or call anybody um, while they searched our home and held me at gunpoint. Um, oh my God. And, and so that was number three. So this uh, is college. So what was that arrest yeah. for? What would did- Auto insurance fraud. Auto insurance fraud. Yeah. So number one is statutory rape. Mm-hmm. Number two violating is soliciting a violation and soliciting a prostitute. Right. Number three was auto, auto insurance, insurance fraud. fraud. And, and then, then number four. The fourth time, um, it was another violation of probation because his wife at the time made an anonymous complaint that there was a weapon in the house, which you can't do if you're on probation. probation. Uh, uh, so uh, weapons violations. Yeah. They okay. came in, they found it, and he went back to jail. So he's just not getting the lesson. Apparently. No, no, okay. no, never. He's yeah. invincible, unfortunately. Okay, and and, and you know what? And uh, if it's okay, um, sure. you you brought up two key terms a long time ago. May it might have been the last episode. They were being a sociopath and narcissism. Uh-huh. Okay, those are two big deals when we're talking about trauma. Yeah. So I'd like to just break it apart, and then you can go on with your story. But I, I it's important that we not only tell the story, but I don't know if the words clinically, I want to discuss some of these key things people should learn in trauma recovery because these come up all the time. So let's start with narcissism. You know what it is. I can explain or one of you probably can do a better job what it is and how you kind of saw that. I don't, I, um, you know, when people aren't here to defend themselves, I don't want to beat up on people that aren't here to defend themselves, but let's talk about what narcissism is. Yes. Okay. And, and it sounds like you're pretty well versed in this. Why, why don't you, why don't you go for it? Sure. I mean, I didn't understand that that's what necessarily was one of my father's issues until recently. Cause now I'm in a master's degree uh, for psychology. So uh-huh. I'm just starting to learn the terms for things that I've experienced already. Mm-hmm. So I'm going, Oh, that's what that is right? you yeah. know, a lot. <laughs> um, but you know, my father is incapable of feeling He's told me that to my face. He goes, I'm sorry, Jesse, I just don't feel. And so I find it to be an interesting thing. If someone's incapable of feeling empathy or feeling like how another person would feel, Mm -hmm. it, it allows them to make choices good or bad because they don't care. They don't understand how devastating it makes someone feel when you do X, Y, or Z. And so I, I would beg my dad, can you please think of me before you make these kinds of choices? Can you think of me before you go on celebrity boxing? Can you think of me before you do this? Can you think of me before you do a sex tape? Can you think of me before you, you know, and he did, but not for very long in yeah. terms of, okay, that's great, but that's not paying my bills. And to an extent, I understand um, when you become this entity, when you are a normal person, not an actor, not someone famous before, and now this is all you are, you can't work a normal job. You can't participate in normal society. And so there's no handbook on how to deal with infamy. Right. And so for him, I mean, I can only imagine, you know, the challenges Granted, he brought it on himself, but the challenges of being Joey Buttafuoco, I don't know. Um, I know what it's like to be Jesse Buttafuoco, but in terms of providing for a family and keeping a roof over people's heads and just even that normal mm-hmm. kind of thing, it's extremely hard for him to do. Um, and I understand that. So he had he felt the need to, well, y'all made me this way, so you're going to get it. And so had no problem doing celebrity boxing or a sex tape or X, Y, and Z to maintain his fame because in some sort of way that would bring small chunks of cash here and there to be able to keep, put me to college or keep it right. Right. And also kind of an addiction to adoration. Absolutely. And that's that grandiosity of narcissism. Yeah, And Um, they don't take responsibility for anything. It's It's ever, it's always everybody else's fault. It's always, you made me do this. You made me do this. Yeah. No response, no self responsibility. Right. Right. And and I'm only talking from my opinions and my perspective, but I kind of see some parallels between that and OJ. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I got yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't do it. No, yeah, 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 yeah. She made me do it if I did do it. Right, right. Come on. Right, right. 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 That's admission you know, right there. Like, okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, like, I don't know if it's it, his narcissism is there, but I think for him and, you know, I'm obviously not here to diagnose anybody or say anything right. like that. Um, but I've noticed traits of antisocial personality disorder. That's is dangerous. Probably the biggest one yeah. with him. 
Um, yeah, because well, and, of his inability. And let's break that down fail. because right on the man, on the bookshelf behind you is the DSM five manual. I mean, we're not going to crack it open and have a, a <laughs> no, psychology well, lesson. That, but, well, that, well, to me, that to me right there is PTSD. Uh, <laughs> oh, is. Oh, we'll hide it. Hide it. <laughs> you you got to manage those triggers, <laughs> Tanya. You got to handle those triggers better. But no, I'm just teasing. You handle the triggers any way you want. Okay, but. But antisocial personality disorder is the formal name. The informal name is being a sociopath. And a sociopath is a very uh, dangerous, very mm -hmm. uh, right. often misunderstood right. uh, complex. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that, uh, you know, it is what it is. Why don't you share and why don't you both share what, what a sociopath is? And, and it's also important to know there's a relationship between being a sociopath and a narcissist. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. All sociopaths are narcissists, but not, not all, all narcissists, narcissists are, are sociopaths. So every or, time. Oh, go yeah. ahead. I was gonna, let's say it all together, class. So, <laughs> so, um, so let's talk about sociopaths. Yeah. Every time the word sociopath comes up, I think of Jeffrey Dahmer for some reason. Mm -hmm. I remember watching him on the news like 2020 or something like that back in the day. And I just remember going, they use the word sociopath. This is before school, college right. and all of that. And I just remember li like looking at this man and they use the word sociopath. And that for some reason, that name, every time I hear that term, I think of Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm. Um, and also, um, oh, I forgot what I was going to say. But that's but, it. Oh, a great book is called The Sociopath Next Door. Oh, ah. Marfa Staub, PhD, out of Harvard. It's a great I, I book. Well, it's a great <laughs> book. On top of that, I'll plug my mother's book, which is called <laughs> Getting It Through My Thick Skull, Why I Stayed, What Happened, and What Millions of People Involved with Sociopaths Need to Know. Wow. Wow. Being married to one and being raised by one are diff two different experiences. Yes. I got to read that. Wow. That, yeah. That's, I have uh, a copy. I'll leave it here for the office. Awesome. Uh, uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, say the title again. So Getting It Through good. My Thick Skull. Because yeah. she's funny like that. Yeah, yeah getting yeah. it through. And also getting it through. Um, I, why I stayed, what happened, or something like that. And what millions of sociopaths need to know. Getting it through my yeah. thick, thick skull. Thick skull. Yeah, yeah. by Mary Jo, named after Mary and Joseph. <laughs> Mary and Joseph. <laughs> MJ. <laughs> okay. Yes. That's wow. so cute. Okay, so we, we would recommend everybody get that book. And you're right, Tanya, The Sociopath Next Door is a mm. crazy a, great book. It's also like when I was reading it, I'm like, Oh my God. Yeah. Like, oh, that's my neighbor. Oh, wow. oh right. my she, God. Martha Stott was outside my window <laughs> looking in at my life. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> like, she's really <laughs> dialed in yeah. on understanding this. And it's, she explains it so well. Yeah, it's a dynamic. Yeah. Reading. Because there are these people, one out according to Martha Stout, one out of 24 people is a sociopath. sociopath. Antisocial person. And disorder. that doesn't mean you're violent. Oh, no, no, because, no, no. You know, sociopathy, it, it, that doesn't, that's not psychopathy necessarily. Right. It's, you know, you're, it's, it's interesting because you think anti-personality or anti-social personality disorder, but like a person like my father is so it's detachment. It's detachment. Oh, it's charm like, is. Charm. So, so yeah. when you hear the term, you think yeah. they're not good at being people. Yeah, people, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. and it's like. They're charming. They're right. charismatic. They're very charming. That's yeah. why you know I'm not one. <laughs> I'm not that charming. But, but no, it's seriously, sociopaths are remarkably charming. I struggled for a while thinking that I was, but I have now come to realize that I have way too much empathy and feeling yeah. um, that I can't. Think. I can yeah. tell. Yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. Well, ta me, and, and disclaimer, neither Tanya and I are licensed therapists. We never pretended yeah. to be. That's not what, what our thing. We're, I'm a researcher. Tanya's an advocate. And, and Tanya has a degree in, in uh, you know, Psychology. mental health issues. -ish. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm more of a researcher, but I work in a field where I see a lot of disasters and I become fascinated with the people behind the statistics and trying to you know, not just understand it, but also try and find some solutions for going forward. Mm -hmm. That's why we host this whole podcast. And wow, we're again, we're just so privileged to have you here. Um, so anything else you want to say about the whole sociopath narcissistic thing before we ta uh, move on to the rest of your story within the dive stage? I mean, not really, because this is about my story, not his. <laughs> OK, but, I mean, I just I guess being raised by someone like that is extremely challenging. Yeah. You know, and it's. Uh, it, I was taking an ethics class in my, my master's degree program and I wasn't doing that well. I still got an A, but I would get a lot of the practice questions wrong mm. because my dad is very Robin Hood, steal from the rich, give to the poor. And it's okay. We have th things fall off the back of the truck, you know? So like my, mm. my 
bar of like what's right and wrong. Uh, it didn't, it's really exist. Up. It didn't yeah. exist. And so when they pose these ethical questions in class, I'd be like, yeah, buddy's trying, you know, I'd get them wrong all the time. And they're mm. like, no, Jessica, you, know, you can't do that. I hate it. Like, oh, really? Oh, you know, okay. Hated like, Vinny. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> but that makes sense. Yeah. But I was like, I'm sorry. I was raised by a narcissistic sociopath. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying the best I can. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, it's funny. talk about a crazy 10 year old memory. My, my memory is a 10 year old going to Disneyland and the beach and yours are seeing dad trail. with my, two serial right colors here. on either side. Right, yeah, and yours right are playing beach blanket bingo yeah. in your bikinis mine, on the beach. Yeah, you know, right no, here. Mine was going to the Bronx Zoo uh, on a school field trip that my dad was supposed to chaperone, but he got lost. And so I just stayed at the front entrance for three hours waiting for him. And then my teacher finally convinced me to go, you know, go on the field trip and then I see my dad with a circle of people signing autographs by the monkey cage and I'm like oh, oh. so you've been enjoying the animals this whole time I've been literally Waiting freaking for out almost panic attack thinking you're dead because you're not here when you should be you know stuff like so that. it sounds I mean I, you're right I, we don't want to dwell on your dad too much but your dad really seemed to embrace this quasi celebrity out of this whole thing uh yeah and and yeah I think he had dreams of that you know before this happened uh -huh. and like baby Jesse oh the cameras are here let's <laughs> yeah. use this you know yeah, yeah, a grown yeah. ass man that's yeah do that. yeah right you were right. playing it as a game like hi here right. and he's like taking it to a whole other level right yeah so it sounds like the whole amy fisher day uh nicole brown simpson's birthday coincidentally um was only the start of kind of layered trauma because your dad's behavior was you know he yeah. went to jail four times mm -hmm. or whatever that was all about uh it, it well we, i want to get to survival stage we'll do that in a minute anything else you want to share about just the the really uh the whole world's kind of coming down the, the whole mess any parts of the story you really want to share yeah i think it's important um to to note that i never coped with any of it i just kept going and going and shutting it down and putting a smile on my face and trying to achieve and just go 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 sweeping it under the mm -hmm. rug my entire life um until you know i and then and then once you know on top of this I started getting into drinking. I started doing drugs. Well, you know, wow. all that kind what of age? What age? 13. Wow. Young because I Trauma. was so afraid. And I would, my feel, my insides were vibrating and just at such a level that a wine cooler, ah, I could breathe. Take a break from the what, it stress. Just my the feet out yeah. a little bit. Okay. I wasn't wasted because I was so traumatized that a couple beers just made me able to walk in a straight line, you know, uh -huh. calm down a little bit. And so um, obviously I knew it was wrong. Um, but I liked it. It made me happy. And I was so not happy. And so when I started, you know, just stealing a couple beers at the block party, but I was still achieving highly, highly achieving. But then I started this, this alcoholic in me started growing and becoming um, manageable in a way um, to where it made me happy. Like and once I got to high school, I started smoking pot a little bit more, started, I worked my way up the social ladder. I was the new kid because I had moved from New York to California. So then I also had real people problems uh -huh. aside yeah. from both of you go like right. my parents got divorced. I had to move like normal people stuff. Um, but working my way up that social ladder, you know, and then I started drinking, finding the parties and that was fun. Like I still am fine, but yeah. like, you know, I was um, never the one drinking and crying in the corner. Like I was the one getting everyone riled up and having a good time. <laughs> um, and I continued to be that way and play hard, but, or work hard and, and play harder. Mm. And so I was still getting A's in school, um, A's and, and my, my senior, my, my, uh, four years at UCSB was a, a shit show. Um, I think my mom had gone to rehab by then. Maybe she did it the year before. Um, it was like Amy Fisher was getting out of jail. My dad went back to some, it was just like my parents got divorced. Like there was so many stressful moments, wow. still getting A's, still getting B's raging cocaine addict by that point. Um, and I'm so thankful now, A, that I'm over that, but B, like, there was not fentanyl back then. Like, Thank if there was God. anything oh, coke, yeah. it was baking soda and it yeah. made my head hurt. You yeah. know, like, it wasn't, Thank like, God dangerous. what it is there. today. Yeah, well, thank God. But, you know, and I was um, throwing away my God-given gifts. Like, I have a pretty good voice and singing, and I was in the gospel choir, and 
I'd be singing these solos to God, you know, but I'd be doing 18 lines of Coke before I got there. I'm like, I'm high as fuck. <laughs> and, you know, it was just this um, beast that kept getting out of control. But at the same time, I wanted to appear perfect on paper. And so I was the president of students teaching alcohol and other drug responsibility. And I would be giving presentations to the fraternities on how to drink moderately and not binge drink. But then like three hours later, I'd be at the frat house doing keg stands, you know? And so it's like, I started becoming this double um, personality. Uh, yeah. yeah. And it was my, I wasn't able to align with my morals. Um, my choices were, and I just, I was, I had uh -huh. too much unprocessed trauma to where mm -hmm. the only coping tool I had was to drink and get high and do drugs. So yeah. you kind of, you kind of hit a lot of the biggies, you know, the, the drinking, mm -hmm. the drugs, the pot, the, um, cocaine, the yep. cocaine, uh, uh that Food, could have gone. I also got some eating disorder, funnel okay. eating disorders up in there. Mm -hmm. I fluctuate between anorexia periods and binge eating disorders. Okay. Um, okay. Periods. So eating disorders. It's all trauma. It's all, all trauma. Man. Adverse childhood experience. Yep. Half. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny. all so, trauma. Wow. Yeah. I mean, it's, and I mean this affectionately, but it's really wonderful. You're alive and here. Yeah. Honestly, me too. Yeah. There was you're a period of time where I was praying to God to take myself off this planet. And I was probably weeks away from killing myself. Okay. So suicide I ideology yeah. is going on. Because eventually the fun stopped and I was 34, just drinking Pinot Grigio in a Starbucks coffee cup starting at 10 a.m. No, uh -huh. I'm teaching classes drunk. I'm, you know, I'm mm -hmm. smoking pot all day, smoking all the cigarettes. I had convinced my psychologist I needed the highest dose of Adderall because I wanted to be skinny. You know, <laughs> it was just like I was freaking buzzing. Like if I right. describe my head, I was a tornado of just an automatic negative thoughts. Like you're fat, you're ugly, kill yourself, you're worthless, you try, you know, it was just so loud. I call it now, I call them the voices in my head. I call them the real housewives of my head because they're just a bunch of bitches that talk shit. You don't want good things for me. Um, I have learned to, they call it externalizing the problem. I have learned to recognize that thought pattern as my trauma. Those bitches pop up when I'm scared or nervous or, you know, something's going on. And I need to just say, girl, look, for a while they sounded like me. So I thought they were me. So I believed them. <laughs> now pizza? when those thoughts come up, I visualize all those hoes at brunch, just <laughs> clank, 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 drown. And I'm like, okay, ladies, go back to brunch. I don't need you today. I don't care if you think I'm fat and ugly. You know, it's like those kind of like, oh my God, where the Ugh. thought patterns come from and, and what they're doing. Uh, and I'm able to share. You know, I told some... you she'd be a great guest. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you, you delivered on that one, Tanya. <laughs> For sure. You know, oh. So we're still in the dive though. That's, that helped me thrive, the Real Housewives. Uh, <laughs> but you know, I was really, honestly, I was so, depression. This is when it finally hit me. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't understand what it was. All I just knew I was crying a yeah. lot. Mm. Um, I was drinking a lot. I was, um, uh, I'm actually, I have, um, in the DSM diagnostical statistical manual. Yeah. Um, I had every symptom of major depression disorder. Mm -hmm. Um, I lost 30 pounds. I, um, uh, my cognition went. Mm -hmm. So like I would read things, um, they'd be incorrect. Like I'd read a billboard with giant letters that said need money. And I'd read it as like feed honey. And I'm like, that's weird. Why is it a question? You know? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, oh, it doesn't say feed honey. It says need money. Like my brain actually like changed. Stopped. Yeah. yeah. The neurology yeah. is a yeah. big deal. I, I couldn't it's formulate. The stress. Like, you can hear me. I can talk. I'm pretty eloquent. I couldn't even formulate words at like full sentence. Like I was deteriorating mm -hmm. physically. My nails were um, concaving in Ooh. from dehydration. So like I, I didn't drink water. All I drank was Pinot Grigio and coffee, um, barely eating any food, maybe, you know, oh, some fruit snacks every three days uh -huh. and um, just complete, like I couldn't button things. My, uh, I, I, I'm pretty artistic. I'm hands-on. Like I couldn't, I couldn't grip a pencil anymore. Uh -huh. Um, emotionally wrecked. I mean, I just, you know, I was ready to die. I was praying to God, please don't let me wake up in the morning for mm -hmm. a month at least, you know, and, um, didn't have the guts to, to kill myself, um, just cause I couldn't do that to my mom. Um, but if I didn't wake up, I would have been like, cool, I'm done, you know? Yeah. yeah. And, um, spiritually just busted uh, vacant, vacant, yeah. just only praying to God to stop. I'm like, I'm sorry. I fucked everything up. Like I really felt I was hopeless. I didn't think I have a, a purpose on this life on this earth. I just, 
I just really didn't think there was anything more for me. I think, yeah. well, I tried, suck it all up. Maybe I'll come back as a cat and try again or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know I, just, uh, I just was ready to leave this planet. You were exhausted. I was tired. And you didn't know how to get out. I didn't. I so didn't it's like continue the self-destruction. I didn't know. Yeah. I didn't. And the thing is, I didn't tell anybody. Mm-hmm. I kept everything to myself because I, I wasn't fine. And I couldn't pretend anymore. I couldn't put that happy face on. So I just stopped going out with my friends and I stopped meeting up with my family because I couldn't fake it any longer. I just deteriorated watching, you know, Law and Order episodes. You isolated. Yeah. Yeah. And just, it was cockroaches in my apartment. Like it was bad. What's what's fascinating about what you're saying, Jesse, is that on one hand, you've like checked all the boxes throughout the whole DSM manual. And let me pause for the audience the, the DSM manual, and it is literally on the shelf behind your head. <laughs> Sorry about the trauma. It's all good. <laughs> but it's the Diagnostics and Statistics Manual for the psychology profession. Mm-hmm. And it actually goes through all these various disorders. And I, after you've, I've listened to your list. I can't think of one you've left off the list. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There may be some, but um, you're going through this. nine criteria, and I'm pretty sure I have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think like that, that sounds like, Eating right. disorders, all oh. of it. The point is, the, 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 you're kind of, you know, it's kind of a dumpster fire of a life on right. one hand. But what's intriguing, it sounds like you're functioning to the outside world. You're kind of functionally functioning normally. Mm-hmm. Everyone I meet, wow, really? We didn't yeah. know you. Yeah, we you didn't know fine. you were going through. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But what's what's so valuable to your to your well, your story is valuable on a lot of levels, but on this component is that people can see that on the outside, things can look fine Mm -hmm. and really functioning well. That's important. And got all your, you know, stuff together and everything. But behind it, you're literally checking every box out of the DSM manual. Yeah. Yeah. That's For depression, for PTSD, for eating disorders. Because also, um, I didn't realize that I had experience complex, extreme PTSD yeah. Um, yeah. to where a doorbell would send me to a level hundred fear that I'd hide under a table, right. uh, you know, as a grown ass woman, right, <laughs> you right, know, right. I still like get helicopters, that. PTSD hovering over. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. And so um, I'm dealing with the triggers more and better, but um, you know, a few years ago I wasn't. Yeah. And it just, like you said, I was tired. I was exhausted. I can't do this anymore. You know, it's just, I'm hanging on by a thread. Yeah. Yeah. But I think what you said, Randy, a perfect depiction because so many people think that the person who's depressed or mentally ill is the homeless guy sitting standing on the corner with his tongue on a light post. You know what I mean? And it's not. It's It's people like me. It's people like you. Maybe you too at certain times. And, you know, maybe Mel, our producer, who knows? But it's like all of us have something. Right. And you wouldn't even think, you know, people would go, you were depressed. You were mm-hmm. suicidal like right. you. And right. I'm like, yeah. yeah, it's not, it's not the lonely person sitting in the corner anymore, even right. though that still exists, but it's people who are out in the public eye, who are sports figures, mm-hmm. who are, you know, sport, uh, like sports casters or news people, or right? Comedians, comedians, or, you know, doesn't, Jim Perry, everybody. Normal. Yeah. So yeah. it's the normal people who put on the facade. Yeah. I'm fine. <laughs> and we know what that stands for. <laughs> Yeah, but it's not, you know, so be, be aware. And I think my mom, my mom saw something in me because I went, I wasn't never diagnosed with bipolar disorder, but she noticed that my highs were really high Mm -hmm. and my lows were really low. Mm -hmm. And she just, so she always knew I battled with some sort of depression, but we didn't know how, like, what do we do? Where do we go? Right. Also, you, know? you experienced a lot of loss before a lot of loss Nicole before Nicole. Went, oh my gosh. You know? And so, yeah. yeah so, absolutely. and thank you for saying that because so many people think that I became suicidal because of Nicole right. and it wasn't, it was just unresolved grief. So right. that's our message in this podcast where it's like, face your trauma as you're going through it. We have enough tools in our toolbox now on the internet, social media, where it's like walk through the chaos, walk right. through that tornado as you're going through it. Right? Yeah. Because if you don't, it happened to you 30 years right. later, happened to me 10 years after, mm-hmm. you know, so it come, it shows up and right. you never know when it's going to show up. And yeah. that's why I'm so blessed to be alive now um, and to be able to do that because that, what you just talked about is like my mission in life now of like, I can't keep my story to myself anymore because yeah. I didn't have someone like me in the media 
that I could look up to that say, oh, that's what they're going through. This is what I can do. Like, I'm going to be that person for the next generation. Awesome. You know? Yeah. And so that's, well, that's beautiful. Episode. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's well, awesome. Yeah. The next episode is getting your, get, getting uh, to survival. Right. Because right now you're dived, you're, you've been through the list. You're at the, at this right. point. Depression. Right now I'm in my apartment, yeah. almost dead, yeah. drowning myself in booze, weed, Adderall. Cockroaches. Not anymore. Cockroaches, <laughs> raid. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then the cherry on top wow. of both of you. I mean, I went through my thing, you know, zero media as in zero, but you guys, you know, you had the media like crazy. And then you got Madonna, your idol, putting the cherry on top with your trauma, you know, with you 20 feet away, mocking you and your family and your dad in front of the whole world. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, you know, that's, that's kind of special. Mm -hmm. I mean, in air quotes that you went through that humiliation, the public shame. Yeah. yeah. It's uh, a beast. Yeah. Let's talk about, before we wrap this up, let's talk about the public shame. It's a, re a topic that's not very researched much mm -hmm. because I'm in school now and I've been doing some research projects Good. because I want to focus on media psychology, the impact of public shame and infamy. Um, the research isn't there. So that's also what's motivating me to get a doctorate degree and do all this stuff because I'm going to be the person to put the research down. Oh, there. That's so we can beautiful. start making awesome. some psychological safety measures in our media and our true crime productions. Good. On top of all that, every time, and much like you, Tanya, I've been asked to participate in a ton of programs, ABC 2020 mm -hmm. snapped scared straight, you know, all these different programs throughout the years want my interview. And they say, well, if you don't participate, we're going to do it anyway. So you might as well put your two cents in. And so it's like, okay, okay. <laughs> but I have never received psychological support for any of that. They never put me with a, um, a psychologist. They never offered me sessions after my interview. And when they interview me, I'm getting re-traumatized. I'm crying. I'm, yeah. You know what I mean? It's like, it's hard. It's not yeah. easy. Yeah, it's not easy. And, oh, and, and I'm in the middle of saying, you know, and then my mother's face got blown off and they're, oh, can you actually say that again? Maybe cry this time. Oh my oh. God. Yeah, you know, or, or, oh, can you hold the helicopter? Can you say that again? Uh, you know. See, I'm telling you, the media like, is your best friend, but it's your worst right. enemy. They are so, right. they can be, not right. all the time, but they can be so incredibly insensitive and that and, infuriates and me. And not trauma. You can informed. see it. Like I'm, It does. I'm and so my getting mission it. I'm is I'm going it. to become a consultant. I'm going to make all these productions, hire my ass so I could be a victim liaison and say, Good. you don't have to deal with oh, that. This is awesome. how you could be more trauma That's informed. awesome. These are the questions you might be able to ask to get a better response from these people. Perfect. Because I watch these, now I watch these programs, right? And I identify with the people they're interviewing. I yeah. know what it's like to be in that hot seat. Yeah. And I look at it of like, they are just further traumatizing these people and everyone's making money. Mm -hmm. With them, yeah, yep. spending money exactly on mental health help after exactly. or booze or drugs or you, you know it's like yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's also a big component um, to this and a big reason. I that's just, huge. You know, I just want to make some changes in this industry, and it's not going to happen until the research is there, and the research isn't there yet. And I'm so, so glad you said that because I did an, an an ID. I think it was an yeah, it was ID oh, TV ID or something. Is the worst. Oh my god, they had me read Nicole's diaries. Yeah, and I was like, where did you find these? But they were all public. They were all public. They're all on diaries. Google Images, and I was bawling. And if I had somebody like you. Consultant, oh, coach, somebody before, like they can get a voiceover after. Our before, during, and after. I, 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 yeah, they brought yeah. me down to the beach overlooking, yeah. you know, this beach, and oh, and I was like, I got to like, I had, I cried and walked away. So that is a huge yeah. need. I mean, I get choked up because if I had somebody like you, that would have been a lot easier because that was really hard. Right. That was probably I, the hardest interview I had ever done. I believe it. And yeah. that's so fucked up. And that's what makes me angry too. Because I don't even think these producers are thinking like that. Yeah, no, They're they don't. No, they don't give a shit. They don't. And that's the thing. Like y'all need to give a shit. Because yeah. Because you are they just don't furthering care. people's pain here. Yeah. yeah. And y'all are making a lot of money. I was number one in the ratings twice. Yeah. Girl. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know? Yeah. And it's like, uh-uh. And so I think it's just, you know, something needs to change. That no would be awesome. That. For, I mean. No. Be, be the change. You, right. You're yeah. the change. Be yeah. the change. Be the change. Uh, yeah. You know, I, I got to say from my perspective, because I've worked on a lot of cases, World Trade Center to, yes. uh, you know, Heaven's Gate and Bikini and Toll Nuclear Weapons Test Sites and John Bonnet Ramsey. Mm -hmm. I, I'm working behind the scenes. I'm quite content being behind the scenes. I think it's cool that I'm kind of now, you know, talking about more publicly. Mm -hmm. I've literally had at least 100 phone calls from TV production companies. And we're talking big channels. I'm not going to name them because I don't want to get into the, mm -hmm. you know, drama yeah. of all that. But, and I've had sizzle, three sizzle reels. 
where I say, you know, I'm happy to talk about it, but I talk about it respectfully. Yes. I'm never going to talk about some of the da- stuff your dad shared with me. Never have, even with you, yeah. You're, because that's what he told me. And, and if he told you, he told you, but I just respect when I make a promise, I keep it. And they wanted what I'm getting at. <clears throat> They want to sensationalize everything, yes. mm-hmm. and they we, we they they want to go through a murder scene. They use my house, which was actually next door to the Real Housewives of the OC, the first episode. <laughs> <laughs> so I come from that neighborhood. Yeah, yeah. that's, a, that's another, another another weird tangent. But but my point is is that. I, I watched this as a reel after telling them, don't sensationalize that. That's not my style. It's not I my do. thing. And they superimposed blood all over the furniture. And I'm looking at this going, no way. Just not. And if I mention the network, you'd just fall over because it's a big, quote, respected network. Wow. Uh, Netflix. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and actually, it doesn't. But uh, That's horrible. Uh, but my point is, is that. That's how they make money. I understand we want to make money, but we can make money in a classy, dignified way. Yeah. And we make Respectful money in a cheesy, way. you know, uh, yes. sketchy way. And yeah. I think we're starting to see that turn now in media. Yeah. Where we're not as exploitative as we once were and as sensationalized. It's not there yet, but I think we're starting to get a little more. I hope you're yet. right. I hope and you're I right, hope yeah. you're a big part of that research and that solution because the media affects a lot of people. Every You day. know, that imitate this stuff mm-hmm. going yes. on. And um, yeah, so I, I finally a producer came to me from New York and they, they seemed to really get it. I was out in New York and we had dinner and they filmed a thing that's it's a, a little four piece documentary and you watch it. And it's like they got it right because they deal with it respectfully. We covered yeah. Jeffrey Dahmer. We mm-hmm. covered um, uh, Mark, where Dr. King was assassinated in Memphis. And uh, I worked on the Flight 93 crash site. Mm-hmm. You know, there was a fourth one. Oh, the uh, Pennsylvania shooting, the mass shooting. Uh, at uh, uh, Parkland? It's not coming to my mind. I'm having a senior moment. Anyway, my point is they handled it nice. They, they, not nicely. That's not the right word. Respectfully. 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 And, and I, I think the viewers recognize that. Audiences recognize I think that. they're starting to. I still think that there's so much cotton candy media out there that, that, you know, activates the parts of the brain that get high ratings and all of that. Mm-hmm. But it's kind of like the tobacco companies buying out all our food producers and jacking everything with sugar and salt, mm-hmm. right. You know, yeah. for addiction, that's what, and it's, it's, it's kind of brain candy. It's, mm-hmm. it's, they're taking it's a drug. people's stories, which are very tragic, very messed up. What you both have been through, what we've all been through mm-hmm. traumas and they exploit it and they just, they, they take a trauma that should be handled in a dignified way and they jack it on sugar and salt and cocaine and any other white powder you can find to make it addictive mm-hmm. so that they can, you know, boast, uh, boost their bank accounts. Exactly. I'm all for boosting bank accounts, but in a, in, there's, a, there's also a right way to do it. Right. Yeah. Um, and I'm so fascinated genuinely with your area of research. We talked about it before the mm-hmm. show, you mm-hmm. know, about your college plans we got more to talk about <laughs> off the camera. And I got some professors that are crazy smart. I'm anxious to introduce you to her. Oh, that's great. You awesome. know, all Let's that. Do it. But, you know, changing the media, uh, the media's way of handling this. I've seen it enough. We've all yeah. seen it. Mm-hmm. That that's that's something that re- really we can make some noise about and I hopefully see that. I happen. hope so. Yeah, that would be great. You know, another thing with media, I mean, you've done this, I'm sure, where it's like they keep you there for six hours uh-huh. and they only do like two minutes. And it's only the two oh, minutes yeah, yeah, that yeah. you like, oh, why'd yeah. you or put crying. that in with it? Right. I've been there for six hours yeah. crying, you know, right. this, like you said, this mm-hmm. is hard. You're re-traumatizing yourself every single time. So yeah, I can't wait to, you need to do this. I'll never forget. Yeah. I did a big, I won't say the network either, but it rhymes with uh, the first three letters of the alphabet. <laughs> um, and I, um, I went into the makeup, hair and makeup room, you know, cause they get y'all dolled up and I was looking good girl. She had lashes. She had the beauty pageant hair. I was I was like, woohoo. <laughs> and I get down, and the main producer of this segment that I was working with for about a year on this thing, he goes, Ooh, can we make her less pretty? We need her to be able to be relatable. Oh my God. They, right. We need her to be relatable. Can we make her less pretty? And they made me go in the hair and makeup chair, take off my makeup, and then just like look like a normal person. Wow. Oh my I God. Said, you know. Fuck you. I would I, I would have looked this way. Telling my story. So, yeah. yeah. I didn't have though, that. I didn't have that yet. I, yeah. I was, that confidence I was still yet. Newly kind of yeah. sober, which we'll get to episode 16. Um, but you know, it was just like, 
it's they even abuse. that we need her to look relatable. Don't put so much makeup on yeah. her. Like, yeah, it's, I mean, what? It's, they're so abusive. I remember, um, I flew to New York to be on Meredith Vieira and mm-hmm. I'll mention it because mm-hmm. I don't give a shit. <laughs> and I flew and on that's this the point too. They scare you into submission. Yeah. So why can't we name these networks? Do better people. Yeah. Do better Meredith. I, I really don't care. I had, I talked to her producer numerous times. I said, these are my boundaries. I said, I will not talk to the kids or talk mm-hmm. about the kids and I will not be on the same platform with any of the Goldman's or mm. any jurors or whatever. I said, right. I am here to talk about mental health. That's it. So I flew to New York with the stomach flu from the night before, mm. sick as a dog, slept, the, uh, spent the night overnight, go to whatever, you know, whatever building she is like the rainbow room or whatever. And, um, or not that that's a restaurant, but anyway, go to like, go there. Sweet 16. The, <laughs> It really, yeah. <laughs> the producer comes in and says, sits down. And he goes, okay, so this is how it's going to go. He says, first, we're going to have Kim Goldman on. No. And then we're going to bring in one of the jurors. Literally and I, everything he said. Yeah. And then he says, then we'll bring you on because we want that reaction. And I just said, yeah. you know what? I said, I'm going home. I'm leaving. Did you? Yeah, wow, I left. Wow. I literally wow. spent overnight, went to the, Thanks went to the flight. green room. <laughs> yeah. And I took, yeah, took the next flight home. I was like, no, I told you I'm not going to talk about the kids. I don't want the Goldman's in the same room as me. And I don't want any of the jerks. Yeah. You know, I've had to do that too. I was like, if you pull my dad out of door number three while I'm out there, it's going to be a problem. (laughs) He's got to go. You know, and luckily that never happened. But I'm proud of you for sticking to your gun. And my mom, I I told my mom and she goes, are you really leaving? And I said, yeah. Yeah. I said, I respect Sydney and Justin enough that I am not going to do this. I told them, I told them my boundaries and they violated it. Well, well, they're trying to- And I never got a phone call from any of the producers or Meredith herself. Wow. Yeah, 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 and so that's, that's wow. they're trying to turn it into the spray, the Jerry Springer show. Yeah, right. Yeah, and I mean, I I could have made a ton of money selling info and pictures and I stories. Bet. Zero. I I've I just worked on a very high profile case, extraordinarily, and they said, "Well, how can we trust you?" I said, "Well, look at the case I worked on. Have you right. seen any of my photos ever show up? <laughs> yeah, anywhere ever? No, right. zero. So you can make plenty of money." With, in a dignified Ethically. way, yeah, you know, and I'm not trying to pr- pretend I'm Mother Teresa. I'm not, but give me a break. This yeah. is really shabby stuff that it's, goes down it, with it, the media. Yeah, it is. But it there's be very good media. There, there I want to. There's very good fair. media. There's some there good, is, and there's but, people making good media now that are trauma informed. That are yeah. hiring consultants to help them with sensitive topics. Yeah, you know, and things like that, yeah. which is great. But unfortunately, the big ones. Are not. Yeah. You're you're the perfect person to do that. Perfect. I, I mean, so. yeah. yeah. I, I see that as just being think, so huge. Because I've never even heard somebody when when we were doing the interview for your for your show for your pilot. Uh-huh. I was like, I never even heard of anything like that. Right. It's desperately needed. It's so needed. Yeah. It's yeah. So needed. Yeah. So media, we love you. Some of you are cool. Some of you are not. not. But we're gonna. <laughs> uh, uh, there's help us on the way. It's a love hate. People that are you need to get your message out. So I know. Yeah, hard. yeah, yeah. So, well, Meredith won't ever invite me back, and right. I don't, would never go. So, go ahead, but other girl. people. But you know what? Like I said earlier, like media can be your best friend, or it can be your worst enemy. Well, you know. well I did a I did a segment with uh, 2020. Uh, Martin Bashar was the reporter. He's the guy That's that told did. Me that I needed to be less pretty. Oh, is he the guy? He was well, the one. Well, not he, but, but the producers. One of the producers oh. from my 2020 growing up, but a few ghost specials. Oh, is that right? Wow. Because I narrated to the camera. I was the first person to actually talk to the camera like a YouTuber or right. something like that. Uh-huh. And I narrated the story. Yeah. Um, and so that's when I came out looking fly and they were like, well, you know. Well, yeah. Wow. But to be fair to the media, I, I you know, the, I got a call from 2020. We filmed at the Ritz Carlton right down the street and I invited Denise. She came on and it was, it was a very good, respectful, it, it, Tells a story, but without the cotton candy, Jerry Springer, throw furniture, drama, drama, right. nonsense. Yeah. You know, absolutely. I'm with you hundred percent. Thumbs down on yeah. that stuff. Yeah. And that's why I love the fact that we're sitting here hour after hour. And I realize it's time for a break. Yeah, I got to uh, pee. <laughs> <laughs> I got to pee and I need to die. So, <laughs> so, <laughs> we'll, we'll, uh, we'll end this segment with the need to all visit the executive washrooms. Yes. Um, but you get to tell your full story without the little four and a half minute clip. Yeah. And I appreciate that. And I love how y'all ask questions. And I've mentioned this before. 
you ask the questions that incite some just like deep stuff. I don't even know how to like articulate it, but you're asking questions that aren't asked in major productions. Exactly. You know, things like this. You're right. And you know why we do it? We do it on purpose. And I'll tell you why. You heal, I heal, Tanya heals. Everybody else heals. Everybody heals, the audience heals as we really explore this rather than slapping band-aids on Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. and pretending we're okay. Yeah, we go deep. That's why we do it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, so post-traumatic thriving where we learn to dive, survive, or thrive. (laughs) The choice is yours. (laughs) (laughs) You guys are so bad. You decide. (laughs) Two words, Tanya, say it. (laughs) The choice is yours. All right. (laughs) Over and out. Oh, it's up to you. Is it up to you? I don't know now. (laughs) (laughs) It's up to you, right? The choice is yours. So I got it right. Okay. (laughs) See you later. Thanks for supporting our podcast. Be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and follow us on your favorite social media. For books, merchandise, or to donate, visit coreiq.com. Post Traumatic Thriving is produced by Core IQ, a nonprofit with a mission to teach the life skills we all need but are not taught in school. Core IQ and the Post Traumatic Thriving podcast are for informational purposes only and do not provide medical or mental health advice. Always consult with your licensed medical and mental health care providers.